Welcome to public. Um, it will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. And we know the rules around the mobile phone uses and there's Wi-Fi details on the seats there in the gallery. That's not permitted to take photographs or record anything. Um, first thing I have down here is apologies. I have one in from um, John Dallet and Rosemary. And John Blair has uh, informed me that he needs to leave the committee at 11 a.m. But we'll be back uh, after after lunch. Is there any other apologies? I think that's everyone. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to advise members the next meeting of the Inter-Parliamentary Forum on the Brexit is on the 19th of March uh, at the House of Lords. The TEO Chair Colin McGraw will be attending. The Common Minister Kiva, Colin Chair Kiva Archibald and Infrastructure Chair Michelle McElveen are also attending. The agenda and conversations are not focused on sector-specific issues but the strategic issues around Brexit concerning information flows, information flows intergovernmental uh, parliamentary relations and government devolved approaches to Brexit at macro level. In terms of reference are on page five. Uh, be, it would be an early morning flight out and an evening flight home, which would be paid for by the committee. Members of the Commission note that the 19th of March is a committee meeting day, and the committee should hopefully be sending off its LCM report and agriculture bill and agreeing a final approach to the fisheries bill. Do you want to go to that? Um, for the chair, so we just need to say that. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I would remain to do all that. But okay, it's a committee of intent, yeah. That, that. Um, I want to advise members that the LCM on the agriculture was laid in the business office on the 2nd of March, Monday there. A delegated powers memorandum and covering letter from the minister was found on 3 to 10 of the table of papers and will be added to the committee's web page. The latest date for the motion to be debated is 20 working days from the, from the 2nd of March, which is the 31st of March. And members will consider the first draft of the measure report on the 12th of March and sign off at the meeting on the 19th of March. Okay. And draft minutes. I want to refer members to the draft minutes. The meeting on the 27th of February at pages 7 and 13. As mem are members okay with that there? Can we sign off on those? Great. Great. Uh, I want to refer members to correspondence page 5 to 17. There's a suggestion and action beside each um, piece of correspondence. I want to draw your attention to the item 4.3 on the LCM in medicine and medical devices. Um, and the suggested action is to take a written brief on the veterinary aspects of the bill. And can I also draw your attention to the letter from the Rural Action, page 27, the suggested action that the points raised are included in the committee report. Um, is everybody okay with those actions suggested in the thing? In the report? Yeah. Thank you. For work programme members, uh, please refer to page 65 to 71. Um, Stella, do you want to brief the committee? Yeah, just, just very quickly. Um, the meeting next week, we will be hearing from Livestock Meat Commission um, as uh, that's the only other real major change to it that there's been um, since. But we will be slotting in to, to the forward work programme for you under committee visits and events, the dates of the motions of the LCMs as they become um, available to us. Member okay with the work room? Yep. yep. Why would you say? <laughs> Try not to even write for anyone. Okay. Big agreement for okay, work, work program. So we'll have an oral, oral briefing now on the the uh, UK agriculture, agriculture uh, fisheries bill. Sorry. Members will find the briefing paper from the research office at pages 11 to 40 in the table pack. I'd like to welcome Mark uh, to the committee here, our research officer. So, Mark, can you like to take the opportunity to make the eighth committee? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, members. And um, I suppose this is one that um, is very much a general overview and a run through. Um, simply being that we've we've had a week to try and do this, um, and that has proven difficult. Uh, regardless of that, on on World Book Day, we probably still managed to produce something that is a book, but I want to emphasise that. The majority of that material is probably more contextual, which uh, and the reason we've done that is to try and maybe give you an opportunity to maybe explore what some of the potential issues are with some of the potential stakeholders. Uh, with that in mind, my intention is just to go through very quickly um, the elements of the paper, and then there'll be an opportunity for for questions, which again I will endeavour to to answer. But as as ever, um, I, you know I have to declare that I may not be able to do that. I'll endeavour to do so, but if we can't, we're quite happy to go away and try and come back to you as well. Um, 
to, to emphasise again, just again, it's not as comprehensive a paper as we would normally do in relation to a bill, but we have tried to focus really, I suppose, on those specific elements or the areas that we think that may be of, of interest to yourselves and to the interests of Northern Ireland. Stella had, had mentioned to you already the, the Fisheries Bill um, was introduced to the House of Lords on the 29th of January. Um, it's similar to the Agriculture Bill we, I looked at previously. It is a successor bill because the previous Fisheries Bill fell um, before it actually completed its journey through the House uh, due to dissolution uh, in October 2019. The, the basic terms, I suppose, of the Fisheries Paper is, is really just to provide a legislative framework um, for fishing access and fisheries across the UK outside the EU and the, the Common Fisheries Policy. And the Common Fisheries Policy, I think it's fair to say, has had a highly significant impact upon the fishing industry here uh, since its introduction in 1983. To maybe assist you on that, I would maybe direct your, your eyes to pages 16 to 17 in the paper. Now, I'm not going to go through these uh, in any particular detail, but I've tried to provide you there in a table some of the key terminology, um, which you will hear both in reference to the the common fisheries policy and potentially in reference to whatever future fisheries arrangements that we have. Um, key things to look at there, and I suppose which have really driven the shape of the industry here, include the, the total allowable catch, um, the issue of discarding, which has been very topical, particularly since the, the last review and reform of the common fisheries policy. Um, Give me a bit of information there too on technical measures, what those actually mean in terms of effectively how the CFP and the goals are managed, what impact it had on local fishermen in terms of days they could spend at sea, the type of nets they could use. Um, those, are, those are all things which the industry themselves will be able to, to give you an actual um, overview of and the impacts of those. Another key term I've put in there on the, on the table on page 17 is the maximum sustainable yield. That's a key term. I'll, I'll revisit it later in relation to science because this is really the sustainable management of stocks. So it's been a, a primary focus of the CFP in, in recent years has been to ensure that stocks are in a manageable and sustainable level. Um, also of interest in relation to, to where we're heading and, and the UK leaving the EU is the concept of the EEZ. I'll revisit that um, in a couple of maps here in a minute, but I suppose useful to see just in terms of what the extent of British territorial waters would be, and as to how likely um, what access to is, is really, as Stella had mentioned, is one of the, the big issues between the UK EU negotiation. Because as you will see when I, I, I refer to the map, it's quite an extensive um, area, and the fishing resources within that are extensive and of, of high value. Um, it should be, maybe just turn to that. If you look to page 18, I've given you a map there just of, um, this is the, the ICES areas, um, the International um, Council for the, uh, I've had a, a momentary, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, exploration of the seas. And ICES, I suppose, really plays a role in both the science um, in terms of the, the stock status, but these areas have also become the means by which TAC is allocated. If you look there at that, that map on page 18, um, the majority of our fleet predominantly operates within ICES areas at 7A, which is really the Irish Sea, and 6A, which is off the northwest of Ireland. Now, there are, um, and there are boats that fish in other parts, but I've just focused on where the majority of the effort is. If you turn over then to, to page 19, just to, to further complicate this, and if you, you aren't, aren't aware of it, one of the, the key species that our, our local fleet um, really seeks to catch is our prawns. And the prawn uh, situation is further complicated within these ICES areas, that they, the ICES areas are broken down into so-called functional units. And you can see the map that I've given you, a figure two on page 19, highlights those, those boxes that are marked 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 to, to 22. That's again where the majority of our prawn or nephrop fleet uh, is actually fishing. Those are done generally on a rotational basis. Just useful to see because some of the science will refer to, I'll have those. And then the final map, as I said, is page 20 there, which is figure three, which really gives you the overview of the extensive economic zone. So that would be the area um, that would, if the, if the UK fails to secure a deal and excludes to all intents EU vessels, that would be the area that would be exclusively fished by British or UK boats. You can see, I suppose, the interesting dynamic in this is that's overset against the, the ICES map. So it shows you that existing areas which, to all intents and purposes, we have shared access on the basis of quota, 
if they cut right through the middle of an, uh, an existing uh, division, as to you can see the complexity in terms of the management of that and in terms of why uh, the EU are so keen to secure reciprocal and continued existing access. Page 21, then, um, I've included there just in terms of what the actual total liable catches were for ICES Area 7A, which is the Area C. So I've given you some of the key commercial species there, um, and you can see the the total allocation for the TAC area, and then the UK and the Irish, uh, both tonnage and percentage. So those percentages will stay the same, regardless of what the TAC figure is set, because that is the traditional level of fishing that's attributed to the UK and to Ireland. The thing I would maybe draw your attention to uh, is of particular interest there, and I know a number of members had, had raised previously, and on previous committees even, there are TAC allocations there for, for this year uh, to COD and whiting. To all intents and purposes, those are notional. It's not to enable our local fishermen or anyone uh, who has TAC to, to catch those. Those are to actually cover uh, bycatch. So, in other words, fish that are caught in pursuit of another species. So it's not that um, there's a dedicated attempt to catch cod. That's a restriction, effectively, in the sense of, well, if you catch those cod as a sense of pursuing prawns or other species. So it's just useful, I think, to flag that. The other thing I want to just draw your attention there to is how uh, the TAC can change, which is table three there again on page 21. Again, these are subject to annual negotiations. There can be multi-annual plans, but again, the Council of Ministers have met historically in December as part of the, the process. It's horse training exercise, and there can be considerable variation in terms of the total allowable catch for a species within an area. You can imagine as an industry the challenges that presents in terms of the level of fishing effort which you can actually engage in. Um, pages 22 to 23, I've given you some of the, the current uh, scientific data um, really from 2019. This was again used by the Fisheries Council in December to inform um, the, the level of catch and TAC that would be agreed. Table 4 there just really gives you, and it is, I've used what ICs actually um, utilise in relation to the, remember I mentioned earlier, the maximum sustainable yield. Ideally what you want to be seeing there is, is two ticks um, within that table. So that's telling you the stock is being fished sustainably. You can see uh, as a result of that, if you look at the detail there, that there are a number where we have issues in terms of how sustainable the catch is. Um, I mean, the, the ones that are probably the most acute are, are herring, uh, south of 52 degrees uh, north. You also have whiting across the entire Irish Sea area. Uh, you have others. I mean, some of the prawn stocks there, for example, are in, in a healthy state within these functional units I mentioned. Remember, functional unit 14, functional unit 15, which are the Irish Sea too. There are others where there may be questions and marks around. Some of those question marks are something that they don't have the data. Some of those question marks um, are simply in relation to the fact that there isn't any data that is um, utilizable. I mean, uh, the COD stock, for example, is interesting in the sense that the, the recognition there is they do not have a full set of reference points, so accurate assessment is not possible. You can see the difficulty faced in if you would have envisioned to, to catch uh, COD going forward is what is the science relating to COD? Um, and that also raises the question in terms of what will the UK government's position be in relation? Will it utilise the same science? That would seem to be probably more likely than not, uh, but that's not a given equally. So there could be a different scientific analysis put forward, because you may hear in, in a previous committee back in 2015-16, there is dispute over the science. The fishing sector here, for example, would say that stocks in some areas are healthier than are implied by the science. Again, that is a, an area that no doubt will continue uh, in terms of debate. Uh, just would direct you then to pages 24 to 25. I've given you there a, a very brief overview of the actual catching sector here. As we had mentioned uh, earlier, it's relatively small, but it is significant for the economy, predominantly of the three county down uh, villages. I also mentioned the fact as a result of, of the, the EU rules under the CFP, uh, you can see there in terms of what we actually catch and what we land in Northern Ireland, it is uh, predominantly focused in those three ports, but not exclusively on the catching of prawns or nephrops. The uh, value of landings, however, I think it's important to say, uh, outside of Northern Ireland is greater than local landings in relation to pelagic and shellfish species. And I think we have to say at this point that that could present challenges 
post uh, transition period in relation if there are additional checks or tariffs uh, pertaining to the movement of goods. So that's something to consider there as well. Pages 25 to 26, I give you a brief overview of the, the processing sector. Um, again, not particularly large in Northern Ireland economy terms. Rough turnover about £94 million in 2018 and about 24 companies with 643 full-time equivalent employees. The significant thing here is the destination, the value of fish products, the destination market. Um, because when you look at the table 7 there on page 26, it's very apparent that seals outside Northern Ireland are critical for the survival of the fish processing sector here. It's 86% of total seals. So it's either being sold in GB or further afield. So the difficulty we have there is anything that could make access in any of those markets either more difficult or more expensive could well be challenging for the sector, particularly given that they've only really a, a net profits percentage of sale figure for the average for the sector was 4.1% is the mostly uh, available data. It's one of the lower figures in relation to the food processing sector. Very quickly then in terms of aquaculture. Again, I have to say a very small scale industry. The only caveat I would put in this is the data in this is the most recent I could find, which is from 2012. And this is cited even in government reports from 2017 as the most up to date data is available. So that may be a question that you want to bring in terms of what the current status is. I'll touch upon another issue later, which actually makes me think it's underreported, which is the lock foil issue. Uh, but it gives you an indication as to, to how small and how many people are involved in it and the types of, it's either finfish or shellfish, the number of sites that we had in 2012. Um, one that I really want to look at here is access to labour uh, in the fishery sector, particularly migrant labour. The catching sector here is more exposed uh, than the processing sector, it has to be said. Again, data can be quite hard to find, but the, there was a 2017 sea fish pilot survey and that revealed that 77% of jobs in the catching sector, this is across the UK, were filled by UK citizens. 10% um, were from EU EEA countries and 13% from non-EEA countries. The difficulty in this is when you look at you in Northern Ireland, we had the highest proportion of non-UK workers across the entire UK at 53%. Uh, and it has to be said too that the greatest proportion of non-UK workers also tended to be found on our NEFRIP. Nefrop trawl vessels, which are, the, as I've already intimated, a, a key sector for our local industry. In terms of the processing sector, uh, DERA data from 2017, this is familiar, you, you remember from the agriculture paper I presented before. Um, the overall food processing sector in Northern Ireland estimated it was 40% of employees were citizens of other EU countries, um, and 3.5 were citizens of the rest of the world. Fish processing in particular, the figure was 24.2% um, from other EU countries and there were none from the rest of the world at that time. Um, that's, as I say, just a very quick overview of that. In terms of issues with the bill, one of the first things to say, I think, is that the impact of a future UK-EU fisheries agreement is obviously could be quite significant for what's within this bill. And in that regard, you are being asked potentially this assembly to give consent to something that there could be significant change to. Um, <coughs> because the EU and UK, as part of the withdrawal agreement, are committed to trying to, to ratify a fisheries agreement by the 1st of July 2020. Some people say that's extremely ambitious as to how likely that is to be successful. Where we are at this point in time, and I've summarised these in table 9 on pages 29 and 30, is the negotiating objectives. Uh, for both sides. Now those are, are obviously broad across a range of areas. The fisheries ones and as they pertain to fisheries are included there for you to see. I'm not going to go into these but you, give you an idea as to where they're, they're actually both sides are at. In summary there are areas of potential and quite significant disagreement which could present challenges for agreement. The main one being that the EU demand is really for continuing reciprocal access driven uh, it has to be said by the regulatory regime of the common fisheries policy. Whereas the UK focus, when you read through a range of those, is actually it's more emph uh, emphasised and more focused on the UK's position as an independent coastal state uh, who would achieve a, a deal that is more similar, it has to be said, to the, the type of relationship that the EU would have with Norway. So that you can see there's quite a bit of... 
distance between the two negotiating positions. Some key questions there, um, and I think pertinent to the, to the bill, and maybe outside of what will be happening, is will DARA have any direct involvement in the negotiations to achieve a UK-EU fisheries agreement by, by July 2020? If a UK or EU fisheries agreement is achieved by July 2020, does DARA believe that the existing bill and its provisions will be compatible with the agreement? Is the existing bill better suited maybe to fisheries arrangements in a no-deal scenario with the EU? How likely is it that DEFRA will have to bring forward a new UK fisheries bill depending on the outcome of both fisheries agreements and broader trade deal negotiations? The other big ticket item um, within this is the Europe uh, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, and that's been a key part of the CFP um, and, uh, and indeed has brought significant local benefit uh, to the industry and to our harbours and our ports here. Indeed, during the most recent period uh, of 2014 uh, to 20, that fund was worth approximately £15 million. Pounds. And there are a range of support provisions there that I have included on page 31, the bullet points there you can see. Um, the bill does, in clause 33, paragraph, paragraph 8, uh, provide a basis for similar funding schemes that would appear within Northern Ireland beyond the transition period. But there is a lack of clarity, I have to say, on that issue. The government has given indications that it does intend to provide funding to the fishery sector and did approve uh, a 37.2 year, um, million three-year maritime and fisheries fund, which was in addition to the MFF, in December 2018. And we got about £3.6 million pounds of that. The previous government had also committed uh, in October um, 2019 to put in place new domestic long-term arrangements, and I'm quoting here, to support the UK's fishing industry from 2021 through the creation of four new schemes comparable with the EMFF to deliver funding for each nation. The devolved administrations will, lead each, will each lead on their own schemes. There are questions here, and I would uh, highlight these. Are there any indications as to either how much support will be available to the fishery sector post-transition period and whether that funding will be long-term? It's a broadly similar thing that we touched upon with agriculture. Is it a ring fence funding proposal um, or will it form part of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, given the fact that EMF funding, EMFF funding was part of the EU structural funds? Another critical question for us here in Northern Ireland is how will funding amounts for devolved administrations be calculated? Will it be based on the EMFF formula, which effectively meant that we got about 10% of the pot? So is that where we're potentially headed with whatever's coming down the, the pipe? Will the UK government uh, continue to stick to the commitment made by the, the previous government in uh, October 2019? It's the same party in power, but it was a different circumstance. It's a different mandate. Will the new funding streams be funded by Treasury, 100%, or will there be a requirement for a contribution from Northern Ireland Executive Funds? And I think a critical question here is, will the new funding schemes include provisions and allow provisions such as gear adaptation that would enable the industry to better adapt to potential new opportunities? Uh, and that would include maybe the use of more selective fishing gear to reduce bycatch and discards, or even to go after other species. Um, will, the, will the new proposed uh, scheme also be compatible with the state aid considerations within Article 10 and Annexes 5 and 6 of the Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol? That's a critical one for me because, again, to revisit what we talked about previously in relation to CAP, we are in a particular circumstance where we are under different conditions than the rest of the UK. So will whatever the actual fund be, will it be compatible with EU state aid rules? And that leads me on to, is the bill compliant with the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol? I'm not going to rehearse the stuff that we talked about previously. I give you the, the understanding that's in the paper. All I would draw your attention to is some of the actual commitments that were required to adhere to, which is in page 33, table 10 in your paper. And those are a number of the ones, the, the directives and the regulations, which again are writ large in Annex 2 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. There's a range of areas covered by those that cover both fishing, safety at sea, and indeed aquaculture. One I would draw particular attention to, and this one uh, is, you can see there I made reference to the third point down on the table, which is Council Regulation uh, number 850-98. Uh, that has now actually been replaced and repealed, uh, repealed and replaced by Regulation 2019-1241. That deals, amongst other things, with minimum sizing for fish that can be caught. I, I just flagged that one because in the event that we didn't secure a deal and 
I'm not saying this could happen or it will happen. It, it, it's something still to consider. If there were differences in minimum sizing criteria, could that potentially impact us if we have to continue to adhere to an EU standard? I just flag it as a question, maybe would GB diverge? So again, regular divergence within issues like this could become an issue going forward. So very quickly, have the proposed provisions within the Fisheries Bill, whether they are UK-wide or Northern Ireland specific, been tested to see if they're compliant with the Northern Ireland or Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol? And has any consideration been given to the potential impacts of regulatory divergence between GB and the EU? Um, the other thing to say is the Fisheries Bill does make reference, numerous references to UK and Northern Ireland statutory instruments, uh, which often implement uh, regulations. Has any assessment been done of how many of those proposed changes will be possible in light of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol? Equally, and I think going forward, what concerns does DARA have in relation to an inability to either influence any potential changes to Annex 2 of the Protocol? And I suppose, I, I just again, I want to emphasise the issue of potentially for, uh, regulatory divergence. The Bill also, and again, similar themes to the Agriculture Bill, has no provisions for migrant labour. Again, it's a Home Office responsibility, but I think it's, it's fairly clear, as I mentioned, particularly in relation to the catching sector, that migrant labour, and it's not just EU migrant labour here, it's just migrant labour, um, is a, a significant component of the industry. And I suppose, again, it's in stark relief with the Home Secretary's provisions and proposals to bring forward um, a, a migrant labour scheme based on skilled labour, because we get into the debate again as to how much of the labour in either the processing sector or in relation to the catching sector would qualify under the terminology of skilled labour. And obviously you will be aware, having been in the, the Chamber of Money, that the, the Minister had made reference to this situation uh, and in the Executive's intent to write to the Government to effectively raise their concerns and seek clarification because I think the figure was maybe said it was 9% of existing agri-food employees would actually meet the qualification for skilled labour. Now, as the Minister made the point, if those people all stay, that may not be an issue, but going forward, if you have effectively people leaving and then other people trying to, to come to work, it could present significant challenges. Um, there are issues here then that I've included as well that aren't within the bill, but they are useful just to paint a picture for some of the challenges we have are unique to us, and I suppose that the bill may well, and the competencies within it fall within. The first one I want to touch upon is the lock foil ownership issue. This one has been extremely long running uh, as to who effectively owns lock foil. The practical implication of this um, is really um, in relation to aquaculture. Um, and it, it's, it's a significant challenge. Uh, the Locks Agency, I suppose, which you will be aware, has responsibility for the management um, of Lock Foyle and, and Carlingford. And they have powers to all intents and purposes uh, to, to license aquaculture. The difficulty with the, the, the situation in Lock Foyle is because the ownership is disputed, the agency can't act with the powers that it has, which to all intents and purposes has led to a bit of a free for all in relation. Um, to the issue of aquaculture on Loch Foy, to the extent, and I'm sure you may have seen uh, in the press in recent years, the, the scale of the growth in the oyster um, industry on the loch. It's actually grown from uh, approximately 2,500 trestles in 2010-11 to around 50,000 today. So that's unregulated. Um, there's a native oyster fishery there, uh, there's a disease risk there, and there's also lost revenue, possibly up to the tune of £20 million. Pounds. This was the, the locks agency estimate. So just put it in there in terms of, and raise the question, is there any progress in resolving the lock foil issue? Because it is pertinent to the, the issue of aquaculture development. And is there any indication as to whether that issue has been considered as part of the wider UK-EU uh, negotiations? The other one, very quickly, is the Voisinage Agreement. Again, uh, has been cited in recent years in the press. It's the arrangement of fact that precedes the UK <coughs> and Ireland joining the EU. And it was to all intents and purposes a gentleman's agreement that boats from Northern Ireland and from Ireland could reciprocally access each other's waters uh, within the not to six mile limit and fish within them. Now that ran successfully until 2016 uh, when there was a, an actual challenge brought by four fishermen down south which was heard at the Supreme Court which actually ruled at that point that the arrangement did not provide legal cover for that operation. So it was unilaterally suspended by the Irish government. 
We didn't uh, take reciprocal action and Irish boats continued to be able to fish here. That did lead in early 2019, if you may recall, a number of, of boats, local boats being actually impounded uh, by the Southern authorities in relation to fishing activity that they've been undertaking in Dundalk Bay. I have to say the positive news since that was that in April 2019, uh, a bill became an act, was passed, became an act down south, which did enable effectively the restoration of the reciprocal arrangement. So there is a legal provision. The challenge, I suppose, for us um, is that that arrangement has worked very well. Some will argue it would be interesting maybe to even ask the industry's view when you're speaking to them later. Um, there were impacts when it was suspended, particularly for our boats, because they couldn't go south to access mussel seed uh, and other elements, and that had a financial hit. Um, was there any assessment done of that? And indeed, um, can the Voisinage Agreement survive going forward? Uh, that, for me, is a, is a question. We'd raised that even in, in 2015-16. Is that something that we could continue to benefit with if there is a no deal? Or can effectively a bilateral arrangement such as this not exist? Is it effectively a UK-EU deal? Or could the UK say, well, I just raised it as a question. Um, in terms of very specific questions, and I realise the time I've had here has, has gone beyond. Um, and I realise that there's a lot to cover. I've just there on pages 37, 38, give you some of the some of the things we looked at. And again, we didn't have time to consider these in great detail. Fisheries objectives, which is clauses one to three, there's a real lack of detail around what some of those objectives actually mean or how they'll be delivered. I fully appreciate that'll be done through a joint fisheries statement and management plans, but they're still very broad terms. Um, the vagueness, does that is that a positive maybe gives flexibility? Or does it equally mean that they can actually be avoided in terms of trying to deliver them? So that you could look at that in a positive or a negative framework. Mark, can I just pause you one second? John, do you want to just comment on something? Uh, there? I'm no, no, not to necessarily. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought you wanted to... Uh, <laughs> Chair, um, the one thing, I, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I apologise, Mark, and to those waiting to present because I, I have to leave for another meeting, although I'll be coming back to the committee after lunch. But, but the one thing um, I could probably ask is, have we any indications, probably more relevant for the department, and maybe others want to take this up, but have we any indication at this stage of the um, change from today's arrangement, which you could loosely call one jurisdiction, um, and what will, in effect, be operating uh, in the future of, I count it as five jurisdictions? Mm -hmm. Not that I have, have, have looked at, John, and I suppose that the, the difficulty is, is it's subject to negotiation. Um, and I think you're right to say five jurisdictions, because the fifth jurisdiction down south is effectively part of the EU-UK. And then, depending on what is agreed in July, um, or isn't agreed in July, there's an internal negotiation within the UK, obviously in terms of the allocation of, of, of TAC quota, and in terms of how that would actually be managed. So there's... There's not a lot of clarity that I saw so in the public domain. The department may well be part of the negotiations that I'm not, uh, but that's, that's maybe better directed to them at this point. Except, Chair, the, the point probably to attach to that is that the, the wait and see approach is, is fine and, and frankly realistic, except also realistic is the expected deadline of July of this year. Ab absolutely, and, and that's to enable, I suppose, uh, new arrangements to be put in place before the end of transition. Now, that's I have to say that's premised upon transition ending in the end of December. I suppose that's a political viewpoint as to whether people believe transition will end on the 30th of December or 31st of December. Yeah. Uh, there are other people who will advocate it could, it could be longer. Would that provide more time? Again, that's a, that's a political negotiation. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're right to say yeah, it doesn't provide a lot of time. Thank you. And thanks, Chair, for that opportunity. No problem. John. Um, just in, in, in terms of the a couple of the objectives. There's one in relation to the scientific evidence objective. Um, again, I just have a question. What role will DARA or AFPI have to play here? Will their role be enhanced as compared to the current activity? Uh, are the scientific methodologies or, or data employed going to be the same as they are currently? And is there any additional money potentially forthcoming from the department or AFPI to enable them if they have an enhanced role to do that? The climate change objective there as well makes reference to minimising the adverse effects of fish and aquaculture effect, uh, activities on climate change and enabling fish and aquaculture activities to adapt to climate change. That's, I thought, when I read it, it's quite vague, and I suppose it raises the question, has there been any local assessment made of the adverse effects of fishing and aquaculture activity on climate change? Uh, and would any additional resources be available to the fish and aquaculture sectors if they had to mitigate any adverse effects that they were causing? 
And would those be a UK or a Northern Ireland responsibility if those funds were required? Um, I don't want to go into too much detail there. The Joint Fisheries Statement, again, I raise just simply a question. Does agreeing a Joint Fisheries Statement across the, the four jurisdictions, do the particular circumstances that we may have to operate with in relation to, I mentioned, the, the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, do those, any of those requirements present any, any potential challenges to trying to agree a Joint Fisheries Statement? I'm not sure on that. I just flag as a question. In terms of access to waters, I'm not going to dwell on these in any great detail. Um, but the Voisin Eyes arrangement, I suppose, as I said, has, has worked well here. Uh, what's the status of that? What is the department's position? Can that continue to exist? Uh, is the government's position to replace the Voisin Eyes agreement? Is it written off? I suppose the difficulty in this is that it's not in statute here, but it is in statute down south. Um, it's a gentleman's arrangement, as I said, a to exchange a letter. So there's a lack of clarity there. And I suppose that one of the difficulties I have in that when I actually read the, the bill was um, Clause 12, Paragraph 1B um, mentions the fact that the government would uh, effectively seek to adhere to international arrangements to which the UK is a party. Is the Voisin Eyes Agreement an international arrangement? I just, I mean, it's an exchange of letters. Does that constitute an international arrangement? Um, yes, and I suppose it, it is a compact in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Is that maybe a, a circumstance under which the Voice and Irish Agreement could continue? Or again, would the EU scupper the uh, Irish unilateral uh, access to, in fact, the UK territorial waters? That's a big question. Licensing of boats. Um, the bill suggests that the UK Marine Management Organisation will have the power to issue a fishing licence for boats fishing in the Northern Ireland Zone. That does seem to run counter to the existing powers that the MMO have, because uh, those, as I read, only appear to seem to apply to Northern Ireland between 12 and 20 nautical miles from shore. Might be something you want to clarify. Um, fishing opportunities, I think, is probably the biggest area and the biggest issue. Because the critical question is, this really would give powers to the Defra Minister to effectively set the fishing opportunities for each of the UK devolved nations. And that, I suppose, is a, the key question there. Is that going to be based on the existing CFP allocations? Or will the Minister be bringing forward new methodologies, possibly new science? These are, those are questions, a new methodology, because we could effectively stand to gain or lose from that. Because I think what's critical there is, and it's similar if we go back to the WTO requirements in relation to the Agriculture Bill, the Defra Minister is obliged to consult with the devolved administrations, but how likely will she or he, or he be to act on any of the views that the devolved administrations express? Um, what I'm basically saying is, in effect, are we confident that the executive will be both consulted and listened to with regard to our view on the level of catch and effort quota that it wishes to utilise within Northern Ireland? And I suppose a critical question here is how will the government manage the allocation of additional fishing opportunities, new fishing opportunities that could come about um, as a result of the e, uh, UK and EU, I suppose, arrangement, or just as the UK has said, taking back control of its waters? Will that be a matter for DERA to decide as well, uh, or will we be effectively operating within restriction, like a common framework? The only other one I've, I've flagged is the mention of the discard prevention uh, charging scheme. It seems to suggest in the bill that this would only apply um, to the holder of an English sea fishing licence or the producer organisation that it has at least one member who is the holder of an English sea fishing licence. I flagged it because I simply I don't know the answer, but I think it's a useful question to ask is do any of our local fish producer organisations actually meet those criteria? Do they have a member who is fishing? Um, or is the holder of an English sea fishing licence? If the answer is yes, then does that mean that the discard uh, prevention charging scheme would apply to the entire fish producer organisation membership here, or is it only to the member that has the licence? Um, that could be a significant issue, and I say that because the, the NIFROP uh, sector particularly, and I've, I've cited um, research there in a, a Q&A from Sea Fish from 2009, Nefrops, um, fishing for nephrops does actually create a significant uh, level of bycatch, which historically, I suppose, was discarded. Um, so it's just simply a, a, I've put it in there as a, a potential question. It is really the application of the first part. If it doesn't apply, the second part isn't an issue. 
Members, that is, is really all. I realise it's a fly-through, and I realise we didn't go into the detail that we ordinarily would, but um, I hope it's been of some use to you, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, William, you're... Yeah, just thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Mark, for your detailed presentation. For me, all this is ifs and buts. At the end of the day, to the negotiations are completed, we don't know where we are, isn't that right? So it's very difficult to make sound judgments and... I think that, I think you're exactly right. Um, and as, what's, what was the reason I made my first general point was that the provisions that we see before us could be subject to alteration, depending on the outcome, successful or otherwise, of the EU UK Fisheries Agreement. But you're exactly right. We we won't know. It's quite possible we might even know in June of that. Well, July. Not, I suppose not agreed to the that withdrawal side. agreement uh, commits both sides to to achieve that. Now, I mean, I, I did put in the paper. I didn't mention it here. Is both sides, suppose, have have upped the ante. To say, well, look, if there isn't sufficient, the UK government said, if there isn't sufficient progress by June, we'll walk away. Um, is that a negotiating tactic? Is that a real threat? These are all questions, I suppose, which are way above my pay grade. <laughs> but what I would say is, um, and I think the clerk had intimated to you earlier, fisheries access is a key bargaining chip. Yeah. And I suppose the, the concern in relation to the local fisheries sector is, what will it be traded for? Um, and there is a price upon its head in that regard because, uh, as I've, I've intimated, it's a smaller part of the overall UK economy, but it's a critical demand for the EU as evidenced by the negotiating positions. Do you think that the regional assemblies have much of an input or will it be, again, that's a political question, isn't it? It's a, it's a political question I'm not able to answer, <laughs> but I, I think, I, and maybe on the last point I raised where I said to you in terms of... Um, in any of these issues where the DEFRA Secretary is, has an obligation to, to consult, that does not mean an obligation to act on the instruction of, and I suppose that you will be well aware in terms of the, the, the difficulties there. Yeah. Okay, Mark. Thank you, Philip. You have any kids? Next. Yeah, just, um, I mean, you've, you've put a lot of questions that we have to ask for people coming beyond you, but yes. in terms of the, the Norway deal, just uh, if you could explain a wee bit more about what it means with regard to fishing. Uh, uh, and most of the other stuff I had down to ask you have actually answered. No problem. Um, I don't, I suppose I, I'll be honest, I don't know a great deal about them okay. as headline figures, uh, Philip. I suppose in, in terms of. The arrangement, I suppose, it's the, the EU would recognise that the Norwegian, uh, it's a bilateral agreement between the EU and Norway. It's probably the single most significant because of the, the fish stocks that are in proximity to Norway. Um, it's, it's done in a broadly similar way, is my understanding, to the existing TAC system. There's an annual fisheries arrangement which is negotiated between Norway and the EU annually. Um, and then there's a range of agreements and arrangements that come from that. So there's effectively TACs that are set for joint stocks. That also has provision for you can transfer fishing possibilities. So if Norway wanted to fish a particular stock within a particular area of the EU, it can swap and give additional access to, to its own stocks. Uh, there are joint technical measures, those things I mentioned around either days at sea or mesh sizes. Those are agreed as part of the arrangements. And there are also, uh, there's also significant agreement and um, commonality in relation to control and enforcement. So that, I suppose, is the, it's a, quite a, maybe a headline overview. If it was something that you wanted us to look at in more detail, I'm sure I'm happy to go away and do. Um, but it's, a, it's effectively, I suppose, it's, it's not as detailed as the common fisheries policy is, but there are a number of principles within it which operate in broadly similar ways. That's my understanding of it. Okay, Philip, uh, Claire. Thank you, Chair. And thanks very much, Mark, again. Uh, I'm going to go back to, you just pointed out near the end there, uh, uh, issues around climate change as well, and I'm seeing the questions that you're re raising here. I mean, I'm going to make the assumption that no local assessment has been made at all, but especially on the back of when you're saying that the most recent government figures that we have here go back to 2017. So how could they have made an assessment if they don't even have data? And I, I think to be fair to the industry and to the department on that one too, Claire, that, that's a new objective. So a number of the fisheries objectives that are in the bill would be okay. ones that were in the previous, were on broadly within the, the common fisheries policy. That's a new objective, new to this bill. So I suppose it, it's, it's maybe a, it's, 
It's a new area of, of work for the department and indeed for the fishing fleet to supposed to consider. But you're right to say there, there's a lack of a lack of detail that now I, I, I fully appreciate and with the way that it's set out the process as Stella had intimated to you, you effectively have at the high level the objectives. Yeah. You then effectively go to the fishery statement that's meant to be agreed and then you go to the management plan. So whilst the detail might be filled in, particularly at the management plan level, I think it is maybe pertinent to ask, well, what is the what is the thinking around what the climate change objective actually is and what it's meant to do? So just sort of try to think ahead. I know that there's political stuff that's yes. beyond your pay grade the, the yes. answer, but you know statements coming out uh, and reports coming from last weekend that um, the Brexiteer advisors are now making the claims that the fisheries industry is you know e um, economically negligent, I suppose, in these negotiations. Um, so up in that ante to try and enter the negotiations. So if they were to sell off, I suppose, or bargain off fisheries um, to allow the financial sector um, to remain, if this is a new area, we would then, you know, if that trade-off sort of happened, we would still be bound by EU sort of standards and sustainability and climate levels. Well, the, as I mentioned, the the object or the the elements of the the regulations and directives that we are ad adhere to and yep. have to adhere to within Annex Annex Two um, of the the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. As I read those, there are none that pertain to climate change as it relates to fishing. So that's important to establish. the The climate change objective is really within the provision of the bill. Um, I think the 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 difficulties I've said to you before in the agriculture bill is that the Elements that are within uh, Annex 2 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol can be altered, and we don't have a say on it. We may, we will, will have a say, but at a relatively low level, if new legislation came forward. So it's not to say, for example, the EU may, under a further CFP revision, decide to bring forward a climate change objective, may decide to write that into a regulation or a directive, and may decide to say, well, that would be great if it was an Annex 2 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. So, that raises questions for me in terms of the level of representation. That could be to our benefit, it could be to our disadvantage. I suppose it's, it's the detail of that is, is significantly further down the road, uh, but it, it, I suppose it highlights again the challenge around the, that are particular to here in relation to the protocol. That's maybe not very helpful, but I suppose I'm trying to, to paint that there's a lot of yeah. unknowns in relation Don't to that. Um, I, I, well, that's, well that's, bear in mind, that's outside that's outside the, the July process because bear in mind the protocol sits as is, yeah. separate from the negotiations. So at this point in time, as we understand the protocol, that's if, if both parties agree to it and adhere to it. Okay. It's it's outside those negotiations. So what's in the protocol at this point does not appear, regardless of the outcome of whether it's a UK EU trade deal or wider, yeah. will change. We continue to have to adhere yeah. to those arrangements unless with the democratic consent of the assembly, we decide not to. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Morris. Thank you very much, Chair. Mark, you, you had uh, alluded to the fact that there's already a, a type of a gentleman's agreement between ourselves yes. and the Republic of Ireland. And you've also mentioned here that under Clause 17, there's an opportunity for us to honour that. How successful do you think that would go during the negotiations? Well, again, and, and I, the, the I new suppose loss it, and the paperwork. I, I am, and when I say that, I, it's, it's a, I just ask the question: Is there a possibility, Morris? Because I'm not a lawyer, I suppose, to say on it. But I read it in terms of um, clause 17. Yes, in terms of, I asked, I suppose, just then, as maybe the departments again better able to place uh, or to answer that one, is in relation to what is the uh, ability really to, I suppose, to to negotiate unilaterally, um, and in relation to license and boats. Um, because to all intents and purposes, that was, the was and I has removed the requirement for us to, to, to license. We find, you know, the, the reciprocal agreement uh, or reciprocal arrangement, we still have to abide by, by rules. But um, I suppose I, I have it in there in terms of, I am not sure whether it could. I simply state it. What is the status of the was and I's agreement? It's literally all is, I've never even actually seen the letters. The department may well be able to provide them. It was an exchange of letters between two civil servants. It was deemed, as I said to you down south, that it wasn't sufficiently robust to provide the, the legal basis for the continuance of the scheme, which is why down south actually brought the, the Fisheries Amendment Act that they did. Um, so that's, that's maybe a question again for going forward. Could that arrangement? I don't know. I simply ask it because it has been of, of uh, mutual benefit and reciprocal benefit. 
I think where I'm coming from is do we do we have the power to make it, uh, if this bill goes through and it's between the UK and the uh, yes. and the EU, do we have the power to have a side deal? Or a local deal? And I, you only call it? I can't I can't answer that in terms of whether we can do I think well and I think the Irish would probably have that question as well, in the sense of can the UK and Ireland do a bilateral deal? Mm -hmm. Some of the indications previously would suggest not that the deal is with between the UK and the EU. In the event of a no deal between the UK and the EU that's where I think that question becomes pertinent. And because there was effectively a deal that existed prior to both member states joining the EU, I don't know would there be a legal basis to contest that. Again, not sure. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Right, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. There's nobody else has any questions, so I appreciate you coming along. That was very, very useful. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to have uh, oral evidence from uh, Area on the UK Government Fisheries Bill. So, members, find the briefing from the Department, pages 74 to 89, as well as the Fisheries Bill at pages 90 to 199, and the explanatory notes uh, are on pages 200 to 249. So, can I welcome Claire Hansen, Grade 5, Acting Director, Marine and Fisheries Division, Paddy Campbell, Deputy Principal, Head of Sea Fisheries Policy and Patrick Smith, Deputy Principal, Sea Fisheries Policy and Grants. You're all very welcome. So uh, I'd just like to invite you to brief the committee and then we'll take questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Chair, for the invitation to this committee meeting and to give evidence in relation to the Fisheries Bill. Chair, if you're content, I intend to use these opening remarks to summarise the briefing paper which we sent you and is in your packs. And then we are happy to take any questions that you and the members um, uh, would like to ask. So, as Mark has already mentioned, um, the Fisheries Bill was introduced uh, in the House of Lords on the 29th of January, just past. The Bill's second reading in the House of Lords was on the 11th of February, and it began its committee stage this week uh, on the 2nd of March. The bill provides the legal framework for the UK to operate as an independent coastal state under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea 1982 um, after the UK has left the EU and the Common Fisheries Policy. The Fisheries Bill describes eight high-level fisheries objectives that the UK Government and devolved administrations must achieve. And whilst some of these objectives uh, originate from the EU Common Fisheries Policy, they've been added to and strengthened uh, to suit the needs of the UK as an independent coastal state. And those eight objectives are, you've heard about some of them already, but they're the sustainability objective, precautionary objective, ecosystem objective, scientific evidence objective, the bycatch objective, the equal access objective, the National Benefit Objective and the Climate Change Objective. So that's all eight. The Secretary of State and the devolved administrations are required to publish a joint fisheries statement that will set out um, their policies for achieving these objectives. And the joint fisheries statement uh, may omit Secretary of State policies that involve the exercise of a fishing quota function or a reserved function. So anything that's reserved um, it is it, uh, uh, sorry, um, is, o, is, it, is o omitted from uh, or would, would be taken for by the Secretary of State. Um, in these circumstances, the Secretary of State may choose to set out additional policies in a separate statement. The bill also requires the production of a fisheries management plans that can be developed on either a stock by stock basis or on a mixed fishery basis to ensure that stocks are maintained at or are recovered to the levels consistent with maximum sustainable yield that Mark explained earlier. Through the adoption of common high-level objectives and publications of policies and management plans to achieve these objectives, the Secretary of State and the devolved administrations will ensure a joint approach to sustainable sea fishing whilst allowing for divergence appropriate to local circumstances. As introduced, the bill contains 51 clauses and 10 schedules, the majority of which extend to Northern Ireland. Uh, the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly will be sought in regard to the Fisheries Bill. 
Looking at those 51 clauses, 45 of those extend to Northern Ireland, and therefore legislative consent would be requ is, is required for 41 of those. And the four clauses for which consent is not required are those ones that are around reserved matters. Um, the Secretary of State's Fisheries Statement, that's two clauses, and the Secretary of State uh, will devolve, or sorry, will determine the, the fishing opportunities, another two clauses, and I'll say a wee bit more about that later on. Um, of the Bill's 10 schedules, eight extend to Northern Ireland, and legislative consent will be required for these eight. The two schedules that do not require legislative consent are Schedule 5, which is around the sale of Welsh fishing opportunities for a calendar year, and Schedule 9, um, which is amendments to specific parts of the Marine and Coastal Access Act, which just apply to England, Scotland and um, Wales. On the issue of marine conservation, Northern Ireland does not have full devolved uh, competency currently. And the Minister has written to his DEFRA counterpart um, to highlight this issue and to ask that consideration is given to fully devolve marine conservation to Northern Ireland through this fisheries bill. In addition to the wider fisheries objectives and the fisheries statements which set out how the devolved administrations will achieve these, the bill contains provisions for Northern Ireland in regard to a number of other fisheries related matters in your briefing pack. And I'd like to just highlight four of these. Um, the first is access to non-UK vessels. The second is fishing opportunities. Third is around cost recovery. And the fourth um, is around financial assistance. And so just starting with the access to and licensing of foreign vessels in UK waters. And I know we've had some difficulties um, with this terminology in, in, in the committee um, previously. So... Um, we just thought it was useful to highlight that in terms of licensing legislation, it's worth noticing or noting that this term foreign fishing vessels is one that is used across the world in most legislatures and de uh, to define vessels which are not registered in that particular com country. Um, and we've just taken the examples of Canada, New Zealand and Republic of Ireland. Uh, the, the licensing legislation that applies in each provides that a foreign fishing vessel is one that's not registered in those three countries. So that's the examples we're given again, Canada, New Zealand and Republic of Ireland. And we're, we're aware of your concerns around all this and would welcome your thoughts on alternative terms. We should warn you that within the Fisheries Bill, the term foreign fishing vessel occurs 53 times. Um, we have picked this matter up with our DEFRA uh, colleagues. We have explained the, the issue to them. Um, but as I say, in, the, in the, the bill that's with the Lords at the minute, that occurs 53 times. So setting that aside for a minute, I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, though you've probably heard some of this uh, in our previous uh, appearances. Um, the, the bill provides for control of access of foreign fishing vessels by licensing individual boats rather than managing access by country. And the bill provides that foreign fishing vessels will have to be licensed by a UK authority to fish in UK waters. And what that means is that the same rules can then be applied to foreign vessels in our waters as would apply to UK boats. So it's a really important piece in terms of uh, ensuring that cons any conservation measures um, are, are applied to and adhered to by any uh, non-UK vessels coming into our waters. So um, it, it's, it's an important piece. Uh, so moving on to the second one, which is fishing opportunities, which again has been mentioned um, so far. The bill creates a new power um, for the UK to set fishing opportunities, which are um, fishing limits measured by quotas or according to fishing effort. Um, as an independent coastal state, the UK will be responsible for negotiating with other coastal states such as the EU, uh, Norway, Iceland and the Faroe Islands and to agree the total allowable catch and shares for stocks that are shared across each other's waters. Um, and so the fishing opportunities for the UK, although those are led by DEFRA as a UK head of delegation, these have always been conducted in a very collaborative way um, to acknowledge the efforts and the issues of the individual um, devolved administrations. So that 
We are expecting that to um, continue as it does currently and you know, could give you some assurance around that, that um, although the, the, the head of delegation piece is, is reserved for UK government, that they have always been very inclusive in those discussions. There's a lot of pre-meetings beforehand before any of those negotiations actually take place. So I hope that gives you a little bit of um, comfort. The department would expect to be directly involved in, with the UK's head of delegation when it comes to considering, in particular, the Irish Sea and the main uh, grounds of the Northern Ireland fleet. Third one I want to pick up on, again, has been mentioned, is on the, oh no, it hasn't, the cost recovery. So the bill extends the cost recovery powers of the Ma Marine Management Organisation to enable it to charge for its services. It provides to the fishing industry, and in Schedule 7 of the bill, that would create equivalent powers for uh, Northern Ireland and other devolved administrations. The fourth one has uh, the financial assistance. Um, so we have mentioned a bit about this. The bill creates updated powers to introduce schemes of financial assistance to the fish and aquaculture industries, matching the breadth of what is funded under the current European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. Um, so we'll maybe pick up on some of that uh, shortly, but uh, just moving to, 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 to finalise here, just in terms of timing, um, subject to the Minister's approval, we'd expect to have a legislative consent memorandum um, with the Assembly Business Office uh, next week, the week commencing the 9th of March. Um, officials in DEFRA have advised that it would need to have the outcome of the Assembly's legislative consent motion um, before the bill completes its final amending stages, the third reading in the House of Lords. Uh, it's expected that the third reading in the House of Lords will be after the um, Easter recess, and so um, working back, that uh, the intention would be to have an Assembly motion on the legislative consent for the Fisheries Bill as quickly as possible after the committee has reported and after the Assembly um, turns from its, uh, returns from its Easter recess. Um, and similarly, the, you'll be expecting that the Scottish Government and Welsh Assembly Government are also working um, to that uh, times, uh, timetable for their legislative consent as well. So that's, the, that's our introduction, uh, but we'd be happy to uh, try and answer as many of your questions as possible. Okay. Thank you, uh, and thanks for uh, the presentation. I'm just going to ab abuse my power now, because Declan hasn't returned, and go first. Uh, in terms of, I mean, you, you pointed out the, the, the foreign vessel and the issue that, that, that we have had. Uh, I mean, I think it, I mean, I accept that it's a term that, that may be used in other parts of the world. I mean, the you know, the issue we have here is that some of us don't see vessels from the south as being foreign vessel vessels, and we had at a previous committee maybe made a few suggestions of uh, other terminology that could be used, and w we may want to discuss that later on. Just some other point that were raised earlier on this morning uh, that I'd like to ask you: the impact of the new immigration proposals on the industry uh, or potential uh, problems that they could have with the fishing industry here in the north. Uh, the implications of the protocol with regard to particularly the processing industry uh, and you know if, if, I mean I know we're at the early stage and we're just setting out the high level and, and a lot of the detail has to be worked out but I mean if, if you're content that the bill is, sits properly with the Ireland protocol and then the, the the last thing just that I want to point up uh, is the, and I hope I pronounce it properly, the voisinage uh, protocol. I mean, it, it does seem that, that this is something that's working well with, you know, fishing vessels on the island. Uh, and, you know, just given what was said earlier on, are, are you of the opinion that this is something that can continue? Does there need to be, does it need to go into the bill you know, who makes the decision and is this something that can be a separate uh, thing that continues outside the negotiations that may be taking place with the EU? So we'll start on the Labour 
one. Um, again, the industry are, are up this afternoon and they will give you the, probably the most detailed um, the most the most detail around that and um, be able to answer all your questions there we're, we're very aware that um, the industry in Northern Ireland is reliant on um, the particularly the Filipino and the Ghana yes, yeah. um, uh, uh, labor market and we know that they are pushing around that whole uh, they're currently um, classified I think as non-skilled laborers which presents problems so um, we're aware of the issue, um, but again, as Mark said this morning, some of that is it's under the, the, the Home Office will have to yeah. take that forward. I don't know whether you, yes. you want to add to that. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, reserved, it's a reserved matter. Um, the Minister has met with the industry in the last few weeks and they've brought that to his attention as well. And I think he's, he's willing to look at it. And some of the industry representatives today may, have, may be able to propose solutions uh, that they'd like to see. Um, but it is a reserve matter and it's something that would have to be taken up with, uh, with the Home Office. Um, Second issue was around the bill and the, the protocol, protocol, how the two sit together. Yes, um, the, bill, the powers on the bill are, are enabling powers, so they enable us to introduce new legislation, new laws. Um, I think where the protocol kicks in is the protocol may limit our flexibility to do things that maybe other places in the in the UK are doing. So Scotland may be able to do some things, say on marketing standards or uh, minimum landing sizes. We may not be able to because we're tied in uh, with having to stay aligned to the EU on certain issues. So I think it, it is compatible in the sense that it gives us the powers to make the, the laws, but the actual powers that we do make might be we might have we'll have to refer back to the protocol and see how far we can go. Whether we whether it, we can't do anything that would be uh, what would require us to be aligned to the EU. So it reduces our flexibility in some way. Um, on the voisinage issue, um, we've, we have been looking into this. Uh, we don't believe that, uh, the, first of all, the voisinage agreement predates the London Fisheries Convention in 1964. It goes right back to the, the establishment of, of, of Northern Ireland, and there's been this reciprocal access all the way through. Um, it's, ter it's terminology, it's, it's a neighbourhood agreement. Now, there is precedent for other neighbourhood agreements to be negotiated outside of um, the general access and our position with the UK government is we would like to keep Vazenag separate to the overall general fisheries agreement with the EU uh, and they've accepted that and there doesn't seem to be any obstacle to us uh, continuing with Vazenag or coming up with a separate neighbourhood agreement. Even if there's no general fisheries agreement with the EU, we don't believe that that would preclude us from not coming up with a new neighbourhood agreement. Um, Mark highlighted the vagueness of the exchange of letters back in the 1960s, which was simply an exchange of letters between two officials that said we would allow reciprocal fishing access. That has been um, regulated properly uh, in the Republic now, but it, that is not the case here. Um, there is a... Uh, a similar agreement that exists between uh, Guernsey and France, uh, a neighbourhood agreement, that's a formal international treaty, and we could, uh, for our preference, probably we'd have come up with a more formal agreement like that that sets out exactly um, what sort of types of vessels, what sort of fisheries will enjoy this reciprocal access, um, and maybe tie it down a little bit. It's a very, it's a very loose arrangement at the minute, and, and you know, really any vessel can go into the 0 to 6 mile area, um, they, they're required at a high level to um, comply with the local laws that are in place, and that is set out clearly down in the Republic of Ireland, but it's less so here. We would, we would simply have an option of, if a vessel breaks a rule here, um, we would simply default to there's been no access agreement, so we would, we would expel them from our waters if they broke our rules, and we need probably something more uh, more formal, but we have a treaty that ties all that down. Um, so, in short, um, if reciprocal access uh, by both the Republic of Ireland and, and ourselves uh, is something that we want to take forward uh, together in future, we don't believe there's any uh, impediment to that if there's no overall fisheries agreement uh, worked out, but we probably need to have put something more formal in place here. Um, 
that's some, that gives similar assurance that they have in the Republic of Ireland. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I just pick up on something there? Uh, obviously, leaving the common fisheries policy, that would also mean the um, the EMFF as well. Um, what is uh, your understanding about what, or if there will be any particular successor to EMFF, and what is, is there any certainty or clarity around its future funding? Uh, there is the, the assurances we have in the Conservative Manifesto. They have undertaken that they will continue support um, for the fishing industry. Uh, our understanding from the Treasury is that they uh, wish to see each of all the administration come forward with uh, bans for funding, what they'd like to spend uh, money on. Um, our process here is we will, we will do that or draw up our future plans and produce an outline business case for those. It would have to be cleared by our Department of Finance first and then it would go to Treasury. At this stage, we have seen nothing in black and white from Treasury that guarantees that there will be funding. They say it's subject to spending review um, and that's really all I can tell you at the moment. Uh, they have indicated previously that they would anticipate that the level of funding uh, each region would be similar to what was available under the EMFF from the EU. And, and would that be would that continue under the protocol? Would that be continue to be under state aid, EU state aid rules? We're, we're seeking clarification on that one. Um, there is specific mention of agriculture uh, funding in the protocol, but not for fisheries. And we're, we're seeking clarification on that. Uh, our preference would be that um, a funding scheme here would be would not have to, or would not have to, be, have to be. If it was, if it was under, if it was an exemption for fishing, it would, it would have to be. We would have to. We could only fund things that, uh, say, the future European funds were funding. <coughs> Otherwise, um, everything would be subject to state to state aid. Thank you, uh, Will, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your presentation. In relation to the issue of foreign vessels, I suppose I don't want to sound critical here, but I do believe the department had explained it a wee bit better. There may have been, I think your explanation today would have made it easier for people to make up their minds. My mind was easy to made up, but for others, some people had issues with that, and I think it would have been explained properly. I think there wouldn't have been an issue, and I'm certain of that. I could be from one member told me that. Um, in relation to negotiations that's going to be ongoing in relation to the common fisheries policy, has the department been asked for uh, their input at this stage, or is not, not, not the case, or is that the case? Have you been given the opportunity for an input into Northern Ireland's current We're constantly stage? working with DEFRA colleagues and colleagues from um, Scottish and Welsh government. So uh, Paddy is uh, uh, very much our leading man on, on all of those, so we are we are constantly being asked about what are our priorities, setting out the, the various the rules uh, of engagement. Uh, and I have to say, the DEFRA team are very uh, are, are very good to work with. There, uh, there's a real recognition of that of the importance of, particularly for fish for fish and fishing, which is uh, you know the fish don't know the boundaries between the, the countries and so there's a real, a real need to work together on a lot of uh, those issues and they are very good at uh, that, uh, establishing a combined UK position on priorities and all of those things. Well, I'm delighted to hear that because I wasn't so sure that that was the case but that, that's, that is yeah. certainly progress and yeah. that's a big help. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Morris. Thank you very much Chair. Uh, you, you alluded to the licences there. Can a vessel uh, be based in the Republic of Ireland uh, and licensed in the UK? Uh, and can boats from a non-UK designation be licensed locally? Are there any barriers or you can envisage any hold-ups or, or, or uh, drawbacks if that were the case? It's a good question. I'm going to hand it over right, to Paddy okay. again. So, yeah, but the Cur currently, um, there are... Uh, uh, Currently, it is permissible for um, any country to establish themselves in the UK and um, acquire a fishing boat and get a, a UK licence. 
and specifically in relation to the Republic of Ireland, yes, you, you can. Uh, you can you can buy a UK licence, provided you can satisfy. It's actually not us; it's the registration of fishing and seamen in the UK. If you can satisfy them that you have a link to the UK, then they will they will register you as a UK fishing boat, and then after that we will license we will license it if there's, if there's a license transferred to that vessel. Um, and there's there's maybe a little bit of a lack of clarity at the moment as to where, whether they're making any changes uh, on exit that would maybe limit those rules for other companies to come in. But I think um, uh, I'm not sure at that stage whether what will that remain the case forward, or whether there be any extra rules brought into play. Okay, just one more, chair. Okay, go ahead. All right, with you. Yeah, uh, you alluded to bycatch as well there. <coughs> What's the mortality rate of the bycatch at the minute? To me, it's a, a terrible waste yeah. to uh, catch a fish yeah. and then throw it back into the sea. It's, it's, it's sort of like how long is a piece of string? It depends. It depends on the species that we're dealing with. Uh, it depends on the fishing method. Uh, for example, currently there's an exemption uh, for prawns uh, that uh, prawns can be still be returned to the sea, so there's an exemption under the landing obligation currently, and that's because prawns have a survival rate of 40% is considered acceptable, so it's better to return those prawns to the sea because they will contribute to the stock and to bring them ashore. Um, some of the flat fish have very high survivability, some of the shark species have quite high survivability, so they're, they're allowed to be returned to the sea. Um, and f but for other species, most fish like haddock, Cod that have swim bladders, if you bring them up from the yep. bottom of the sea, then they're dead when they land on the boat and they, they, they're dead going back, so they were the, the worst affected. Yeah. Well, my, my point of my question is I like say dogfish and, and, and yeah. things like that, there you can put them back. Flatfish, whenever you catch a flatfish, it seems to live forever. But uh, you're, you're right when you say the swim bladder swells up and it comes out, out, yes. out the mouth, and they, 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 they are dead, yes. so what's the point of putting them back? Uh, well, they, they are un under, the, under, the, under the generally under the uh, the bycatch reduction or objective, the bycatch reduction objective and, and the EU landing objective. Um, it, the principle is that you must land fish except there's an exemption for it. Mm -hmm. So the only exemptions are um, the main one would be survivability. So if the fish has a reasonable chance of survival, you're allowed to put it back, but everything else has to be landed. Clear that up. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much. Uh, maybe we want to look at, I mean, we know our marine habitats and our ecosystems are, are under threat. Are you content that what's contained within this bill tallies up or doesn't conflict with the commitments contained within the Environment Bill? So the, the ecosystem objective links up then with all the marine environment protection legislation as well. They're, they're all working to an ecosystem objective. Yeah. Um, so that those are, I think the, the answer is yes, okay. uh, that, um, that, that, that the objective within both um, systems over, over, overlaps. Um, MSY, uh, the maximum sustainable yield and the precautionary principle, those are all um, within the uh, environment bill and within the marine strategy regulations and, and, and uh, so, so managing marine uh, environment and, and fisheries is moving closer and closer together all the time, it's a good, so it's a, a good thing. Yeah, yeah. great. And so just following on from that then, what are the department doing or are there plans to do um, anything to try and update the data collection? So we were hearing earlier that you know, the most recent data collection figures go back to 2017. Um, anything being planned to try and look at that? Was that on the... Well, uh, there are various states of data collection depending on the stocks. So most, mm -hmm. most, quote, most fish quota stocks uh, there's generally very good data, and there's yeah. a, a data collection program that is currently funded by the EU and will be funded by the UK government in the future. But AFB uh, will be involved, and we see that continuing. So that, uh, I think Mark referred to the International Council for Exploration of Seas that does stock assessments. We would 
agreed, but at the moment the, the UK policies will continue to contribute to that process and will contribute at science to that. There are data gaps in some areas. Um, we published a, an inshore fishery strategy some years ago, and one of the things in that strategy was we had poor data for a lot of our inshore stocks, like clams and lobsters. And that is being addressed. We've, we've funded extra work there to um, gather extra data uh, on those stocks. So wherever there's a data gap, um, where our funding resources permit, we will try and, and fill that gap. Uh, and certainly for fisheries management, uh, it's, it's vitally important that we have as complete data as possible in all our stocks so we know how much we can, we can take. I think it was Mark had mentioned that on the, ac the aquaculture data and that he was only able to get data back to 2012, but I, I think there is certainly more up-to-date information than that within the department. So, okay. um, but the, yeah, that's it's just as, as <coughs> Paddy was saying. They, uh, you know, we're aware that 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 the non-quota species, the data collection uh, uh, needs needs to improve. But we do definitely have more up-to-date data than than, than what he uh, cited. So. We also heard then that there's been a rapid and recent um, expansion on unregulated oyster fishing up in Loch Foyle. Um, is the department doing anything about that? Um, so on the um, on the aquaculture activities, so there was illegal trestles um, coming up on um, our side of the loch, if you will. Um, so and we did take enforcement action um, on that. La I think that was last year, maybe the year before. But we pointed out to the because the it would still be for anybody. So it's managed as a wild fishery. Um, at the moment, but if anybody wants to go and lay trestles, so we, we were able to do that because it was the the area was being accessed um, on the on the Longfield Bank um, side of Loch Foyle, okay. and we did go, and, and we all I think we also alerted the Republic of Ireland authorities to what we'd done. Um, we we let them know that we had we had done that. So if it was accessed from Northern Ireland roads, um, we. We went as uh, took, uh, I don't think we had to take enforcement action. We just pointed out to them that they needed, they would need um, a license to proceed um, with with that activity, and uh, those trestles were removed. The same thing isn't happening on the those sites accessed from the Donegal roads, so that that, that is not happening at the moment and is a concern. But we would not. We would not go to the Donegal side to, to do that um, currently. And does that apply to, would that be the same for more inland areas? I'm thinking of Loch Ney um, and fishing that's going on there. And it, it, would that be unregulated as well or not? It's, it's not. Uh, it is, it is, it's regulated. It is, it is the regulated. The yeah. problem with lock foil is the, the jurisdictional issues yeah, yeah. And, the, yeah. and the ability of the lock agency to exercise their powers. I understand that. It's been a long standing problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But everything that happens then, all the fishing that goes on in Loch Ney and maybe our inland areas is all regulated? Uh, yes. Regulated. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, Harry? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just three wee questions, Chair. Um, one for clarity, really, just seeing the word foreign was mentioned. I'm just wondering if you could tell me. I'm very sure I read somewhere that if an English vessel is fishing in NI waters, that it requires a licence from NI to do so. Is that right? And that's looked on as a foreign vessel too, would that be? Uh, no. No. no that's um, not you right. can, you, uh, uh, currently, the current situation is you receive, um, well, we, we license each other's vessels. Huh? So uh, currently, we would license vessels registered with us and they get in effect a UK fishing okay. license so they can fish wherever they want and the same with Scotland they get a, a they would get a license from the Scottish authorities and they can fish anywhere they want in the, in the UK and elsewhere subject to local restrictions or you know closed areas whatever that happen to be in place that's great no, thanks for the clarity I just had read that somewhere yeah. I thought it was strange I want a bit of clarity don't thank you for that and just a wee question. What level of participation have DARA and the present negotiations that will achieve an EU UK fishery agreement for July 2020? Go on, yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> they, those negotiations, uh, they, 
the GAN this week, and I think Fisheries was, was, was on the, at the agenda this week. We have contributed, along with the other devolved administrations, to the opening EU or opening UK negotiating position. So that has been agreed, and the mandate that was uh, that the delegation went with for the Fisheries Agreement has been agreed. Now, what they're dealing with for July is, is from the UK's point of view, is a high-level agreement. So it's general terms of how they would conduct. Uh, annual fishing negotiations, and they, they, they may get into the territory of agreeing in principle to have reciprocal access. Um, but we're not actively involved in that, the, act, the actual negotiation that the UK government is taking that forward. After that, um, then you would get into, if, if there's been that general fisheries agreement, then we would be in a position where you could have the detailed negotiations on fishing opportunities towards the end of the year, and that'll probably happen around about. October, November time when they start to get into that and deciding um, between ourselves and the other coastal states um, what shares of various stocks that we have that we do share, each of us will get, and what access and so on we'll provide. Uh, and in that stage, we're probably more involved in those negotiations, as Claire has pointed out earlier. There's, a, there's already an established system that, we've, that was, has been created for many years uh, when we went off to Europe to do the annual December Council negotiations and fishing opportunities. We had this collaborative approach and we'll see that continuing. Again, it'll be the UK government that will be the head of delegation, uh, but we've been assured that for ourselves in Wales, if there's anything being discussed about Irish sea fishing opportunities, we will be there to support uh, the head of delegation. Mr. you lovely there, but at present you have no part. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, um, Bob? Just even following on from uh, the point Harry's raised, and, and it was mentioned earlier on about the, the, the bill being more potentially adapted for a, a no deal scenario. I mean, if there is a trade agreement, is, is there going to be a need for a new bill, or does this current format allow for uh, the eventualities that may come out of a trade agreement? And then the second point, just following on from Claire uh, in relation to Lock Foil, and, and it's maybe not something. That the uh, Deer Department uh, even remit, and but it is important, as you say, uh, that uh, we can't manage lock file properly. So, is there any any intention to resolve the issue of lock file? Tell me to take first. Do, do the bill first. The yeah. bill first of all. Uh, I think as I tried to explain earlier, the, the bill to us is uh, provides us with enabling powers. So I think. Where the problems with the clash with the protocol would be is if um, UK, other UK policies, they decide they want to do certain things, and we say, well, we'd quite like to do that too, but we can't because we have to stay alive with the protocol. So I don't think at the moment there's certainly nothing I can see that prevents us from complying with the protocol, but there are obviously there are still some uncertainties about the protocol that we're, we're still looking into and investigating, and we'll be keeping an eye on the situation. Uh, as the year progresses, and if there's any alterations do need to be made, then we will have to we'll have to raise those matters. And moving on to Loch Foyle, so um, we met with the Lo the department met with the Loch Agency and the counterpart, uh, the the Republic of Ireland Department as well, in October last. And this issue was raised, and the concern about well, uh, about mismanagement or non-management of the loch. And at that point, um, an action, the permanent secretary took an action to write to, I think, the Northern Ireland office, which is the, uh, I think, and uh, sorry, it's complex. So, um, but I think that was the action he took, um, or that he agreed to take on that to raise this um, from a DARA point of view. That we realise that this is something that is really for. Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the UK. It's not a. It's not a devolved. The the jurisdiction issue is not devolved. Um, but I think because we had concerns about the management of the loch, that um, the permanent secretary agreed to write then at that point to NIO to ask them to raise this. Now, where that has got to with the return of ministers, I I, I just don't have off the top of my head. Um, but we I, we can. Um, I can take that away and we'll try and answer where that was. But it is recognised that Dara does need to raise it but, uh, because we would have concerns about the 
kind of Klondiking of, of, of trestles and uh, as, as, as Mark mentioned earlier then about, you know, disease and all those sorts of things. So I, 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 if, if that's all right, I'll take that away and, and uh, give an update um, as to where we are with that. It was an age Mark too. <laughs> could, I, could I just add a point Sorry, just to your first yeah. point, uh, Philip? Um, Outside of the bill, there's a scoping exercise that we're undertaking with the Departmental Solicitor's Office currently to uh, map out the extent of the legislative programme, the Northern Ireland legislative programme, to give effect to whatever legislation applies here, um, to give effect to those EU regulations that are in that Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol. So that's a separate piece of uh, subordinate legislation we're undertaking. We're mapping that out currently. Thank you. Claire? Thanks. Just, thanks, Chair. I'll come back on one then. So the, the bill gives the area extra enabling powers, um, and that's right. But then given the likely increased in fishing opportunities as well, do you feel that the, the department um, needs to do anything more to ensure compliance with conditions under licensing? Um, so I'm thinking again of the lock foil, and I know that that's other departments, the FA and Commonwealth Office, whatever, but if this is going to open up other markets, um, are you sufficiently ready to to be able to have the, you know, if, if you've got enforcement powers, just making sure licensing licensing is complied with. So, um, through throughout the the, the 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 Brexit process, there's been a, a number of UK working groups looking at um, about t ten ten different working groups looking at different aspects, and there is one on. Uh, control and enforcement going forward, and what is what is needed there. And in fact, that group is chaired. That UK group is chaired by our um, chief fisheries officer uh, here, Mark McCacken. Um, so we have been looking into what are the implications of you know the the of ensuring that uh, UK waters are well protected in future. The whole lock foil bit is probably slightly outside that because it's bad example limited. Yes, that, yeah, I get uh -huh. that I understand. Um, but you know, we, we, are, we have a fisheries um, protection vessel, we have a fish, sea fisheries inspectorate. Um, there's probably lots of challenges uh, moving forward um, in, in terms of how that, their roles are going to evolve with the new Arrangements that are in place, so we're we're stepping through we're stepping through that process um, to try and uh, see if there are additional risks with the new uh, you know po post exit, um, and we're looking for more resources in, in that area as well. So. Okay. Um, just the back of what Claire said there, um, has the department undertaken any assessment of? the uh, ability of the local fishing industry to take advantage of um, increased fishing quotas? We have, uh, we have mapped out what we expect an assessment of uh, the benefits arising out of Brexit. And one of the things that we need to be aware of is that um, our main fishing opportunities for our fleet landing in the Northern Ireland are mainly in the Irish Sea. So we wouldn't have the same wouldn't have the, the scale of Brexit benefits that maybe Scotland might anticipate getting in the North Sea, where a, they would see a bigger, a bigger imbalance in, in fishing opportunities. Um, as far as the prawn fishery, which is our main fishery, um, there's Mark referred to earlier uh, matters of uh, the way that's managed under functional units. We think that might have to change, but we don't think that our share of uh, Nephrops would would increase significantly that we wouldn't be able to take um, our opportunities. I mean, for example, in the last few years, I think you know, every other year they maybe take their full quota of prawns in the RSC. So some years they take the full quota. So the currently they're not, and some years they don't take the full uh, fishing opportunity for prawns that is available. Um, where we see we might get some benefits is in some of the um, whitefish stocks, so cod and whiting in particular, uh, also perhaps place, um, where there's a mechanism within the current EU system um, called Hague Preference, where the normal UK share would be reduced when this Hague Preference is, is applied. And our fishermen for many years, and I'll probably tell you about this later on, for many years, they've, they've felt that that's been a disadvantage to them. Uh, and certainly, there's a, there's a benefit to be gained there by reversing 
or not having that reduction applied. Um, that will give them some extra fish, but as Mark again pointed out, for, for the likes of cod and whiting, these are bycatch species, so the, the fishermen wouldn't be going out to deliberately target those species, but they would be bycatches in the other fisheries. But it's still important to get higher quotas in those, because if we don't have enough quotas of those species, you would have to stop the main fisheries. The Ephrops fishery would have to close early, the Haddock fishery would have to close early if they didn't have enough cod or whiting quota. So um, I have no concerns about them being able to take um, the extra fishing opportunities that would, that would come about. Um, there are one or two species, uh, place and sole, for example, which are caught by um, specialised vessels called beam trawlers. We don't currently have any beam trawlers in our fleet. Um, those fishing opportunities are currently taken by the Belgians. And if, if uh, there was more of those species came to um, the UK in the RSC, then um, the industry may see an opportunity to, to go into that particular fishery and they might need support uh, to do that, but that's something that we need to talk over with them. But uh, obviously in the absence, uh, th as a result of uh, leaving the CFP and the, uh, the, the EMFF then, and no certainty from the British Treasury or any future funding, then it may be challenging for fisher, the fishing communities and uh, Fishermen and fisherwomen to take advantage of. Well, that, 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 you know, we're, we're hopeful that there will be uh, still be funding available to support the fishing industry, and, and say that the Conservative government said that in their manifesto. But at this stage, we haven't we haven't seen the money on the table. I trust, I trust that, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, just before go, I'm very conscious that the, you know, you're talking about very fresh produce here, and 80 percent of it is uh, for fish is exported. To Britain and to other parts of the EU, um, have you any assessment of the impact of any barriers uh, in the event of a, a no deal? Um, you know, causing any trade barriers or delays? Any assessment that would have on the industry? Um, well, the well, protocol applies to us no matter what mm. happens, whether there's a, a trade deal or not a trade deal, the, the protocol will apply. So that resolves uh, most of the issues between material moving from the north yeah. to the south. Um, the, the trade deal will mainly affect the, um, any tariffs that might apply. Yeah. So the further apart the two sides are, then the greater the tariffs there will be on product. Um, we yeah. have... Uh, consulted with all the processing, main processing companies in Northern Ireland. Um, we did it previously for the, and there was a threat of a, a no deal exit and we're now doing it again to explain the protocol to them. Um, so they are going back and considering how that affects their business. And we know, certainly know of one business that uh, in Kilkeel that brings in a lot of material from Scotland, England, yeah. processes it all in Northern Ireland and then sends it back out again to the GB. There, they potentially uh, could be significantly impacted yeah. by, by um, the virgins. Mm -hmm. um, Morris? Thank you, Chair. Uh, th thanks very much for your answers so far. Uh, let's go back to Loch Foyle again. It's a concern I have about the, the, uh, the oyster beds and its potential of disease. Uh, I've used monitored the threats uh, to potential disease. The foil is a, is a, is a major Atlantic salmon run and uh, sea trout, and there's a large population of flatfish in and around there, as you know. So any, any chance of disease there could be catastrophic, not just for the foil itself, but, you know, you've got the strule, the fawk and the roe, you know, uh, the fin, etc., all, all, all relying on salmon migrating through the, the loch. So the types of disease we've been talking about are really oyster diseases, uh, like uh, bonamia was one of the, the ones, mm. but they wouldn't be transmittable to That's fin right. fish. Um, and in terms of are we looking out for that, yes, the, the locks agency would do um, a lot of work on, the, on, on, on that area. Uh, but again, that would be alerted back to our, ourselves. So we do keep close eye on, on and, and our uh, that would be our, our fish health inspectorate as well would 
would uh, play a role there. So the locks agency are kind of on site, but we have a fish health inspectorate uh, who would look at all the shellfish beds around Northern Ireland and keep, uh, you know, keep a, a watch on disease um, status. But again, that those those shellfish diseases wouldn't be transmittable to to to, to finfish. And of course, you would, you would send that, that information across to the, the public as well. Yes, very close links, uh, very close links uh, with the Republic on any animal health um, issues. And of course, that is all within the protocol. That's all um, recognised. You know that that the our um, animal health status and plant health status is, is recognised as as a uh, as a just discreet. Thing for the um, island, island of Ireland, and that we we will be required to continue to monitor the health status as the way the, the EU does that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And Philip, you're looking back in. I, I was just in your point, uh, Chair. Uh, not, maybe uh, this is maybe too broad a statement, but it, there is the potential for the fishing industry here to be able to fish and catch more. Uh, which is a positive thing, but in terms of the negatives, you know, b because of the new immigration rules, they might not actually have the people to do that. Uh, and then, just in terms of the point that you were saying about the checks that 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 will come in as a result of the protocol, and then potentially, uh, if a, there's a bad trade deal or a no trade deal, uh, the, the tariffs. So you could actually have a situation where, you know. You think it's positive in terms that you can fish more, but because of all these other things, it's actually having a, a greater negative impact on the industry than we currently have. Uh, this, this is the big uncertainty at the moment. We won't know where we are until the end of the year. And so we're trying to work with the businesses, to try and understand their businesses and how they will be affected. Okay. Hey, Morris. No, I. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As far as the prawns go, I mean, I would like to think there is an increased quota. And if there is, I mean, I believe that uh, we can sell and process more, but we would need a good maritime fisheries fund to allow fishermen to improve their fleets. Do you think something we could? Um. Yeah, we, we, well, first thing we need to get funding, um, and the second thing is then we need to, depending, so as I explained earlier, we're currently exploring how the Northern Ireland Protocol will affect future fisheries funding. It's it's not it's not mentioned specifically, um, and if if we have to, we may if we have to align with European funding to get around state aid rules, then that might limit you know so. If, if Europe wasn't allowing investment in new vessels, we mightn't be able to allow it. You know, so there's, a, there's still a lot of uncertainty about that at the moment. I can't, so I can't uh, can't say whether we could or we could not do that at this stage. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. As we have uh, no further uh, speakers here, um, and again, the speak, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, yourself, Patrick, Claire, and Patty for coming here this morning and for answering all of our questions and giving evidence and tonight we'll be interacting with you in the time ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Hey, folks, we're, we're going to um, order of business is slightly changed here now. We're going to hear some oral evidence from uh, Kevin, Kevin Quigley. Yes. Kevin Quigley is the Chief Executive of the NI Vice-Trees Harbour Authority. And, uh, You're very welcome, Kevin. And uh, very much. Thanks for uh, for um, coming at earlier slot as a commission uh, was yes. previously oh, on. So we really appreciate that. So we do. So, uh, Kevin, do you want to take the opportunity to brief the committee, and then members will ask you some questions? Uh, very welcome. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, please excuse me if I am a step on etiquette. So approaching eight years in post, this is my first. Committee meetings. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, first of all, a little about us. Who is NEFA? Uh, as you'll know, we are an ALB uh, and are granted ownership of our Glass, Kilkeel, and Portafogli harbours. We are charged with improving, managing, and maintaining these three busy harbours. We also have an administrative office in Downpatrick. 
Uh, I can say with confidence, feedback from staff, stakeholders and our sponsored body, DERA, all say the same thing, and that is that most of the time we deliver well. I can honestly say that I am proud of each of my four teams which consistently deliver, ex deliver exceptionally well. I think we're doing a good job. Uh, we have a simple and aspirational vision, and that is to set the standard for fishery harbours by delivering excellence in all that we do. Be careful about asking about this. I can go on for some time. Um, of course, we don't achieve this uh, all the time. And when we do make mistakes, we work hard to learn from them. But I can say with conviction that you can be confident that this ALB is striving every day to deliver well. That said, we do this with just 21 staff and 18 full-time or 18 full-time equivalents. So needless to say, while we are far from inward looking, our prime focus is in delivering our remit. We enjoy an ex excellent working relationship with DEER and we rely heavily on their support. So as I say in my formal submission, the management of fisheries is outside our normal remit and we rely on briefings from DEER. That said, of course, we do take an interest in relevant legislation and we have our own view, but we do not claim expertise, particularly me. Okay, operationally, we're self-funded. Uh, our prime source of income is the levy on landings. So it's important to us that fish is landed in our harbours and, and uh, that we get a, a growing, sh not our fair share of that, which is around just over 2%. Uh, so we have... Uh, uh, a very uh, self-interested interest in seeing our customers do well. Um, of course, we want our customers to do well anyway, but when they're doing well, we do well too. So first of all, with regard to the legislation, uh, we welcome the enabling legislation, which transfers powers to the development and institutions, particularly in Northern Ireland. While I appreciate that this adds complexity, some complexity, we believe overall this can deliver a better outcome for Northern Ireland fishermen, who are a small, very small part, as you know, of a bigger, bigger industry, a much bigger industry, and I think a local focus on that is going to be good for the industry. However, a point, uh, looking forward, traditionally, the fleet from all three harbours has spent time away from home fishing in waters right around the United Kingdom, up in, around Scotland and the far side of England and, and the south of England and over the Isle of Man as well. Uh, it does seem likely that post-Brexit the UK fleet will overall have more quota. It would be our st strong view that whatever post-Brexit arrangements are delivered, that this history should be reflected in improved quota availability, not only for the relevant local devolved fleet, as in the Scottish fleet, but that Northern Ireland should get a reason, their fair share of that, as if they were 1% of it, they should get a 1% increase from Scotland, which I... I'm not sure that this is a legislative issue, but, and that fish doesn't normally get landed in us, but if the fishermen are prosperous, they're easier to work with, I find. Um, so we would be keen to see that. And while I mentioned we are operationally self-funded, we are entirely dependent on grant aid for capital works. Obviously then we welcome the inclusion of powers for the Assembly to issue grants for this purpose. Indeed, currently DEER has commissioned a review of the opportunities for the industry going forward and what investment will be needed in the harbours to meet that, uh, those opportunities in the long term. Uh, we believe that uh, the changing nature of the fleet uh, will require significant investment in, in all three harbours or one, in one particular harbour. That's the purpose of the review to, to establish. Uh, of course, I have we, our authority has opinion, but um, we, are, we are tasked to look after three harbours with equal enthusiasm, and that's exactly what we do. Um, so we'll, we'll welcome the outcome of that, but we will need, of course, grant aid just to maintain the harbours, and if there's significant investment, a very large-scale investment, we'd also that would have to be grant aided. Um, some of the reluctance I'm going to turn to just to abandoned vessels, which I have in my submission. So significant is probably the most critical issue for the authority on my risk register, which is a slightly unusual risk register and it's very operationally focused and therefore quite a number of risks. I have three red risks associated with this issue um, and that is uh, abandoned vessels. Uh, currently I have seven abandoned vessels in the harbours, at least two in each of them, and nine vessels that we regard highly at risk of becoming abandoned. Um, no. 
uh, my board and I strongly believe that the pollute pays principles should apply. Uh, currently, that is not the case, and vessels can legally easily be end up abandoned. Uh, we believe legislation is required to ensure this outcome. We have worked hard with DEER to address this issue, and much work has been done. But a long-term solution requires legislation. Um, I'm advised that this this particular bill isn't the appropriate piece, place to go with this legislation. Um, uh, uh, but uh, and hence I've asked to, to maybe to present it when the environment bill comes before you uh, to, to talk to it maybe perhaps in more depth at that stage but I haven't got the funds to deal with this problem uh, and at the moment it would cost about a quarter of a million to deal with the seven vessels and another 550,000 if nine and then there will be a constant there will be a stream of vessels as vessels retire if, if this if the, if the worst case scenario presented itself um, uh, and, and that's my bit on that, and uh, that actually concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, that was uh, very uh, helpful. Um, I suppose um, uh, just want to ask you a question, just out of interest Fine. on the, uh, the the seven vessels. Uh, mm. Just, just uh, out of curiosity, you know, who owned them, and how did it happen that they were abandoned? How did we get to this place? Abandoned your property, you know, can the owners not be traced? And uh, you know. well, what what, um, what happens? Um, uh, what happens is uh, the the owner um, will attempt. Well, we try to restrict that now. Attempt to remove anything of value in the vessel and sell that on, and then the vessel will. We will find that the vessel has been sold on to people we describe as Johnny No Hopes, uh, uh, who may have real addresses and may have, uh, and may, um, do generally, sorry, do generally uh, exist, um, or in one case are in prison in England, um, we can't reach them. Uh, so the vessel eventually just becomes abandoned and a uh, significant issue. Obviously, the risk around ultimately they must be disposed of. But in the meantime, I have an uninsured vessel that may sink in my harbour, and I haven't got, I haven't got. If I deal with, if I do deal with these vessels, I will become, in the view of the fishermen, obviously the preferred solution to their problem, which is how do I get rid of a vessel? Uh, so we we would like when they're you know when they're selling the license that that would be the time that there's that that legislation wakes up to the fact that. It's the fisherman that has that had the benefit of that vessel that needs to be ensured that he pays for the disposal of it. So clearly, you know, obviously you would view this as a, as a quite a serious legislative gap. Um, yes, uh, there is no legislation around mm. um, requiring. You know, if you, if you want to get rid of your car, you can't just park yeah. it up on yeah. the side of the road. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be the same that you can just park up. A vessel that's going to cost forty thousand pounds, thirty to forty thousand pounds to yeah. dispose of. Now, some more back. There wasn't even a place in Northern Ireland to dispose of them. So we have, and hopefully, uh, our council will grant us an amended planning permission for this. But we have got planning permission and a license to dispose of these in Port of Ogie. So it's almost a little industry we're trying to get going in Port of Ogie to get a little boost for Port of Ogie as well. Uh, and we worked hard to get that, and it's been was, wasn't easy. But that's in place now. So it's, there's an affordable solution. We've arranged. We've worked. The authority, uh, in, with the support of DERA, has worked hard to ensure that there is this affordable, uh, relatively speaking, affordable solution. Thirty thousand is a lot. I appreciate that. But they've had the benefit of of, of it for for maybe twenty years. And Kevin, just before we bring the members, you, you did make reference to the possibility of enhanced quotas, and mm. also you made reference to the changing nature of the fleet and the need for investment. Um, how well placed do you feel that um, fishing industry would be, from your experience, would be to, to um, make maximum opportunities of any enhanced quotas that may well arise? Um, I, I, it's a mixed answer yeah. uh, to that. Um, there will be and I suppose, like any industry, there are the, the there are the go-getters in within all three harbours that are hungry to do business and to do business better, and to exploit every opportunity that comes along the way. Um, and they're there, uh, and I enjoy thoroughly 
working with them and we also of course have people coming up to retirement and are more focused on good times in Spain perhaps <laughs> than, uh, than what the industry can offer them going forward. So they're looking at exit routes and unfortunately the nature of the industry is, is that retirement Retirement is not as always followed in the past by the son taking over the business. Mm. I see us moving to a more corporate model over time, and of course, creating is an issue. But the one thing that has impressed me in the in the eight, nearly eight years now that I've been working with the fishermen, all three harbours, is is their ability to get past difficult times. We've had fishing famines almost in my period. Uh, when, when the wind blew from the east and they can't go fishing, basically. Um, and there's, there's real enthusiasm for, for fishing in all three communities, and, uh, which we support, uh, school education programs and things. So, yes, I think they will. <laughs> Sorry, shorter answer, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Philip? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, I suppose the, the farmers are fishermen uh, harbouring thoughts of good times in Spain. <laughs> Just hope Brexit doesn't ruin that opportunity. Uh, but, uh, Chair, as in most things we, we were in sync and you stole the question that I was going to ask in relation to the, the, the vessels that are, mm. that are being abandoned. I mean, it do, does seem quite a serious issue. Mm. I, mean, I had in my head example of a car that you just couldn't do this with a car it may be something that the committee could consider writing to uh, the dear minister to see if he has any plans or proposals to tighten that up because it's a serious cost but it's also a serious environmental uh, issue as well mm -hmm. yes and um, we did successfully there was a vessel abandoned in Bally Halbert which was originally a port of Ogie vessel called the Ocean Venture uh, which was moved to Bally Halbert and our uh, North Town Council I got the name right. Um, took on um, the disposal of it, but it was moved to Port of Ogie, and we did have a successful decommissioning there. So the principle of doing it in Port of Ogie is established, and we have an established contractor who, who did a very good job. And we, uh, from the point of view of the environment, every every box was ticked uh, when it came to the disposing of it. So we have an established working method of getting rid of them. It's just getting the fishermen to be enthusiastic. And I'm very concerned if I leap in, that uh, that will be the Your default position. <laughs> you okay, Phil? Yep, that's... Um, Harry? Okay, just more or less to follow on from you, Declan, and Philip, yourself, that was on the same point. Are the, the boats beyond the point of repair or refurbishment? And well, obviously you said you were in conversation, mm -hmm. tried to be with the owners. And have you the powers to remove these, or is that where it's complicated? And would your biggest worry be that they're taking up valuable space or that they're at a risk of sinking? Yes. Right. Um, they're they're end-of-life fishing vessels. Yeah. So the so part of the model of fishing in Northern Ireland is, is very there's very few new vessels. Mostly they're second hand and uh, sometimes they're very old. We have fifty year old vessels actually active fishing out there. So these are these are end of life fishing vessels and um, Sometimes they get sold on for new lines as uh, houseboats and or other other uses, and uh, uh, that's that's good, um, and we're all for that. That's as long as they leave my harbour. <laughs> <laughs> Harbours, uh, as long as they leave. Um, mm -hmm. So there's the risks for us are uh, multiple. Really, the, the first is yes, they have very little value. Um, there will be some recovery of steel, scrap steel. Most of these, most of these boats are wooden. One of them is entirely steel. Um, so there's some recovery of co the cost of disposal through recycling, um, you know, selling the steel and that sort of stuff, and more valuable uh, metals. So that, that can be done. And what we have done, uh, our powers are very limited. I'll come back to that. But what we have done is to effectively now stop vessels de taking more valuable stuff on off but we we that's a fine line for us for instance the winch is, is valuable uh, um, but we can't really stop them taking that off because they can switch winches and stuff like that. but we certainly don't allow them to take the engine out of the boat because once the engine's gone that's the boat's utterly and totally worthless but we uh, before we tightened up 
some there was one or two boats they didn't manage to get the engine up. Uh, um, so we, we've tied up, but our powers to actually enforce that is more more around we have powers, but they're not modern powers. So, uh, in answer to that part of the question, what we are currently doing, and it's in my business plan for next, my proposed business plan next year, which my my board's business plan would be more appropriate, um, is is to uh, work with solicitors to draw up a harbour order for the authority. So our our labelling legislation is based on uh, 1973 uh, 1973 acts. In Northern Ireland and 1847 Harbour Powers Act. So um, there's most modern harbours would work under a harbour order, which gives us much more general powers. At the moment, if we want to do something, it has to be under a specific heading, and it's very difficult to uh, to make it happen. And, and this will give us much much broader powers. But we are open harbours, so vessels can come in, uh, and we can't stop that uh, if they're. Generally, if they're well vessels, they can come in. And we've very limited powers to force them to leave. Once you're abandoned, how do you force an abandoned vessel to leave? To leave? But generally, they're fishing boats, and then for a while, we're uncertain about their future, and then they become abandoned. So that's why I have nine at-risk vessels. Some of them will leave, and some of them, some of them may ultimately become abandoned. But we're focused on relationships with those. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very welcome to the committee. In relation to a couple of issues, I know fishermen in the past uh, felt they were very badly curtailed. It was in the past being a member of Europe and not being able to fish fully in the waters. Is there going to be, or do you believe there will be better opportunities outside Europe for the fishermen? Um. That's a big question. Uh, it's a big, it's a big question for me because um, that would be a more uh, one to be to be addressed to Dara. My understanding is, and I've, I I take input from both Dara and uh, Harry Wick from NIFPO and Alan from uh, NIFPO, um, is that they do see opportunity um, and maybe uh, a broader range of access to some fish. I don't think there's. No, I don't think anybody sees a huge increase locally, but they, see opportun they do see opportunities for, for improvement. Uh, I, th I think they're probably a little bit optimistic about the idea that there might be less legislation or less controlling legislation. I don't think anybody... Most people Very hard to get rid of the red tape, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> it tends to go the other way. That's my experience. In relation to fishermen retiring, is it not possible for them to sell on their, bu sell on their business in that regard? Well... Um, that's where the, the license becomes important. Um, so fishermen, have a, a, their retirement fund is perhaps in savings, but it's also made up of what the vessel is worth and what the license is worth. Boat is generally owned by fishing organisations. Okay. So uh, the license, the license, and I'm not good on the figures in this, but it did go up significantly in price uh, when Scotland, Scottish, Scotland. A significant increase in demand for license. So let me explain license to you. So if you want to have a bigger boat, your license is is is. No, I'm not an expert in this field either, by the way. But this is my understanding. The license license is related to the horsepower of your engine, basically. So you can have a certain license with a certain amount of power in your boat. But if you want a bigger boat, you need a bigger engine and you need more license. So there's a demand for bigger. Bigger boats, bigger engines, uh, demand for license increase. So your retirement fund just shot up. So guys in their mid fifties who are going to likely maybe work on into their sixties saw an opportunity. But even without that boost, it's a fundamental lumpy part of their retirement plan. And the other traditional thing they did was uh, strip the vessel out just before. Strip the vessel. Of anything that of value, and uh, then they disposed of it, um, and that that route has disappeared. So um, they now they now have continued to strip the vessels, and then we said, no, you can't be doing that because that gives us with nothing, nothing to sell on if the vessel becomes abandoned. So if we at least hold on to the engine, that could be four or five thousand pounds that goes towards the disposal of it. 
Am I answering the question? Have I moved on? You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> yeah. You're okay. Uh, Claire? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for coming and welcome on your first visit. I hope it's not your last. <laughs> um, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts in, in when you're looking at the financial assistance element, um, I think, and rightly so, you, you point out that the harbour infrastructure could improve through all this mm. um, and that investment in the um, conservation and the restoration of marine and aquatic environments. How would you envisage that looking or taking shape? Okay. Um, in the in the broader in the broader sense in um, in, the, in the environment, I th we we have in our values, our environment and community are, are kind of linked together in, in one overall value. Good. So um, we're very focused. We we are as an organisation. We don't believe we're uh, a little harbour uh, independent of the local community. We work with with our local community. So we support fishing festivals. We've a primary school education program. So we're we're actively involved in all three communities, and we encourage our staff to do volunteer work or coast guard work. Mm -hmm. There's a little, just more a bit about background. Um, I hope today to get uh, grant approval from FLAG uh, to uh, hire an environmental officer for two years. It's going to help us uh, to enhance, improve, bring ourselves to the cutting edge of. of Dealing with waste and, and looking at whatever ways we can improve our environment in the harbour. Uh, and we, we are uh, I'm hopeful that grant will come approved through today. So we're actively working as an organisation. I just want to assure you that we as an organisation take the environment part of our role very seriously. We're dealing with um, a lot of waste. Not all of our waste is generated by any means by the fishermen. We have a considerable amount of visitors, and Northern Ireland visitors are the same as the ones. That the councils have to deal with all the time. So, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, we as a nation we're not maybe the best when it comes to waste, um, and I, we, and we deal with that. And so we're looking. We're always looking at innovative ways of, of dealing with waste and dealing with oil. And in small ways, we're doing that. So we want. We're keen to get somebody bright on on the scene that has real background in that area. So hopefully today I get grant approval. Um, in the wider scheme of things. Modern, uh, in the wider scheme, the changing nature of the fleet. What does that mean? I suppose the changing of the float, the fleet will go to more. Well, I think the more part of smaller boats has already arrived. We've a lot more smaller, under ten meter boats in the harbours, and that's partly driven by the difficulties of recruiting crew, and partly driven by the opportunities that our inshore fishermen have. So there's there's. A number of economic drivers for why that's happening, but that has largely happened in all three harbours, and we facilitated that in Ardlas and Kilkeel with putting in pontoons. In, no, in Kilkeel and Port of Ogi, in Ardlas, take a very serious investment. We need to dig a hole to get a pontoon in, and so it's 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 a big something we want to do. We don't have the funding for it at the moment, uh, and it's much safer for the for the. The owners of the boats, they're not climbing up and down ladders, it's, it's, it's a ramp. It's much safer environmentally, it's much better, they can get stuff on and off the boat, they're not tempted to dispose of waste in this, the ways that they might have been because it's easier to deal with. So that's something that is very practical at that end and we've we've worked with the fishermen to provide them bait stores so that uh, their bait isn't left on the quayside. Um, uh, presenting all sorts of aromas to, 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 to visitors. So um, on that side, on on the bigger scale of things, then over time we're 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 moving to just if you want to have good crew, you have to be able to pay them well. You need to have a very profitable boat. Your boat needs to be bigger and deeper. And our harbours are not built really for that kind of vessel. And that's the way we're moving. Now, that said, least suited one is our busiest harbour, which is Kilkeel. Um, so uh, we see we see that to fully utilise the op opportunities, and it's we think in beyond fifteen years in our thinking when we because that's the kind of investment it's long long term investment. Uh, we see a need for a significant investment, probably in one of the harbours because it would need to be a very significant investment, and that's not my decision. I don't I don't I will give information, but that's certainly not our decision. Um, uh, but we do see the need for, and that would have to be, 
done the engineering and environmental studies with happen. There's a process that exists to ensure that that would be done in, in, without damage <coughs> to the environment, minimum impact on the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Good luck with your, your grant application today. Thank you. <laughs> um, I should also add there too, uh, Kevin. One of the um, one of the the visits that we're planning is to go down to some of the harbours uh, as a committee, and I'd be delighted to and, meet you. Um, we look forward to meeting you and obviously learning more also about the harbour and what you do, but also um, what you've been doing with the community as well. You oh, know, uh, absolutely. That's, that's delighted. Exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll move on around to uh, Morris. Thank you, Chair. If you follow on from, from, from Claire, and I know you've, you've got an application and you hope to be successful today, but your capital grants that allows you to maintain, enhance and mm. improve the, your harbours under your control, do you believe what may come from the government after Brexit and Northern Ireland's share of that pot? Will be enough to, re to replace the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. Um, I'm optimistic and concerned. <laughs> really, I, I mean, I don't have sufficient insight mm. to know what's coming. I don't think that's been decided yet. There is a promise that there will be funding going forward, um, uh, and that's all I, I can say. So I'm optimistic. Uh, I am concerned because um, there's a significant, there is significant funding coming from Europe, uh, and of course. We, we see that we see that as a risk that there won't be the same level of funding. It has been declining over the years. Um, each each round of funding tends to be less for us. Well, for us anyway, our experience of the funding is less. But we've been able to deliver what we've been required to deliver within that funding framework. So I I am hopeful. We will need funding. There's no question. About that. Just to you, Chair. Just now, are we are we rider there on the the abandoned ships you have. I remember a local councillor about 20 years ago had decided the best way to get rid of them would be take the engines and everything that was polluting out of it and uh, sail them up the Causeway Coast and scuttle them and create reefs. Mm -hmm. But I'm not suggesting you do that. <laughs> that's not that that's very approach. environmentally friendly, Morris. <laughs> that approach is no longer no, <laughs> no longer on the cards. No. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, the fishermen would be at with, with view that here's a fishing boat, it's a wooden fishing boat, what can it? But that's their. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not suggesting. I'm gonna, no, I know you're not. Um, uh, but we, 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 what we want to see it is a, is an affordable solution, and where we minimise our cost to, to the fishermen to enable them to use our facility. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, um, all right. Okay. Thank you again, Chair. Um, Kevin. You said you've been on your post for like eight years, I think. Well, it'll be yeah, just the other side, just on the other side of the summer. Yeah. Would you say that in this past ten years the harbours are improving, that they're not declining at all, that you're seeing an improvement? And we'll take out the answer first, now of another way. All right. Okay. Um, the, the, well, um, the physical nature of the, the the amount of landings coming into the harbours in my time. When I joined, there was a very gloomy. I'll be honest, it was a very gloomy view uh, in the authority about the future. And since I joined, we have been able to generate sufficient surpluses to enable us to undertake a minor capital works. So the major, major works we, we do through grant applications, but minor things like a new davit, a new crane for this key site, we pay for that ourselves. That is capital investment. We have to generate a profit for that generate the reserves to do that. So we've had year on year we've had we've had enough money to be able to do that and keep our reserves at an acceptable level. So from the point of view of has the fishing been good um, during my time? Yes. By and large there's been periods when it hasn't been great, but overall there's much more optimism about during my period. Um, and have the harbours infrastructure improved? Yes. I mean Nature of things is the decline, and you restore. But we have also improved. Okay, just one other one. Oh yeah, you're in charge of three harbours: Kilkeel, Arglas, and Portavoge. Mm -hmm. Would you say they're all doing equally well, or would one be doing better than the other? And if one is, what's the reasons? Um, no, they're not. Uh, they're not all doing as well as each other. Um, in our glass, uh, our glass, we used to have. The two Northern Ireland, 
two of the three Northern Ireland pelagic vessels. Voyager is a very, very big vessel. It's the ocean-going one. Um, they, they used to land in Ardlas, and uh, their, their replacement vessels were just too big. Uh, and now, they now land in Belfast. Now, pelagic fish is high value, large quantities all in one go. So that was a significant loss of income to our glass and to us. Um, uh, so that, for that in our glass, the, the number of vessels in, in our glass has remained reasonably stable. We've seen some recent decline. Um, uh, but we, again, we're, we're seeing vessels, older vessels being replaced with bigger vessels. So the capacity hasn't diminished somewhat. In much in, in our glass. Kilkeel remains very bit, very busy. It's it's become a much more mixed port. It also has guard vessels as well. In, um, it is a guard vessel in guard guarding industry that they have developed in in Kilkeel with vessels go part time fishing vessels, part time guard vessel, which uh, is obviously a good mix if you can get it. Um, so it's our it's our biggest and busiest harbour, and it's the busiest because there's much more infrastructure, much more um, processing and repair industries are all based in the <coughs> key, and it's the only harbour where we still have an active fish market. Um, Port of Ogies are are one. It's going through a difficult period. Um, now uh, I've referred to the the the, the change, changing nature of the fleet. Uh, and we've foreseen that coming for some time that fishermen would retire and then uh, fishermen would retire uh, and slowly would move, move to fewer bigger boats. That kind of happened all at once in Port Foggy, except that we've seen a lot of vessels go and we haven't seen very many big boats come back in yet. I believe in the longer term that will happen because there's an opportunity there and these fishermen sooner or later they can't help themselves. They grab the opportunity. Uh, so I've, I'm confident in the long run, and in fact, our prime element of our funding, in this round's funding, most, the vast majority of it, as it happens, is actually going to Port of Ogie. They'll be future-proofed at the end of this funder, funding round for a considerable period of time. So you're saying we can't turn that around again? That oh, way? yeah, I, I'd be very optimistic. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, and most, um, finally, before you de depart, um, Kevin, uh, what just, you, you mentioned at the outset there that um, one of the ways that you make your funding, obviously, you, you, you rely on, on capital grants. Um, mm. One of the ways, uh, you know, but you said you, that you have 2% levy on landings. Um, would you have any assessment of what percentage those landings are from trawlers within the north? And also uh, from Britain or from the right. Have you any assessment of that? Oh, yeah. Right. So I um, couldn't give exact figures here, but um, by far and away, the vast majority of our landings, I mean, well up into the 90%, are local fisher, fishing boats, what we would call registered, registered fishing boats, registered to us. We get visiting southern boats. There are still pelagic boats that land in our glass, which are from... Southern Ireland, and uh, they 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 would represent now maybe five to ten percent of the landing value in our glass. Now, um, top of my head, that's always risky. Um, so that that would be our main um, landings that come from outside of Northern Ireland, but the vast the vast majority of our landings are the boats. That's great, uh, Kevin. So, of no other speakers, and I should just say before you leave that um, I'll be representing the committee here at the Interparliamentary Forum on the 19th over in the House of Lords. We're meeting the EU Select Committee over there and the other regions. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that the issues that you've raised today, we will be raising them across there as well. So, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Good meeting you. Been a pleasure. We'll see. <laughs> Delighted to say. Thanks we'll see much. you down there whenever we get the chance yeah, to. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you down there, folks. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye, Kevin. Okay. Town Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.